Hey everyone. Welcome back for the third part of Legacy Undone. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons, making these videos would be impossible without you guys' support, especially with all the restrictions YouTube places on my type of content. As always, the full story is already out over there for you guys along with about 30 other different stories you can enjoy. Also feel free to send me any messages over there if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat. Link to all of that will be in the description. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 21 He was bleeding. He found that happening more often of late. Rain poured down from the sky above, drenching the remains of a battlefield, corpses fresh corpses were strewn across, being burned as quickly as possible. The others hadn't noticed him yet and he didn't have the strength to call out to them. The rain battered him like a thousand blows. He lay in the blood mulched ground and waited. He opened his eyes again when he heard the call. The sun was beginning to set then. Here. Over here. Glazed eyes tried to focus the world was blurry at the edges and the sound of footsteps seemed so distant even though he could see their silhouettes so close. Naruto-sama. Naruto-sama. Stop shouting. I'm alive is what he wanted to say. What emerged was an unintelligible wheeze as his head lolled back, feeling the bark of a tree pressed against his skull. Get a tourniquet on his leg, we have to stop the bleeding. His pulse is erratic, scan is showing dangerously low blood pressure, his chakra is almost gone. Might go into arrhythmia we have to get him out of here now. Hey! He wanted to laugh. What they meant was to get him to Sakura, or Tsunade. Either of them would get him back in top shape in 10 minutes. Amateurs. Somehow though, he knew that when they returned to camp, one would be dead, killed while he'd been here, acting as the rear guard. He failed. Which one died again? Zero. He woke with a start, feeling a hand pressed against his shoulder, and his right wrist under the vice-like grip that held the kunai at bay from cutting whoever had touched him. His eyes snapped open, adrenaline rushing through him before he looked up, calming immediately at the sight of his attacker. Itachi hovered over him, dark eyes gleaming in the night. Nightmare? It was more a statement than a question. He nodded. Yeah, sorry. She let him go. No need. Would you like something to return to sleep? Or to wake? He looked to the window, still finding the dark of night. What time is it? Near 5 a.m. She answered. He thought for a moment, then chose to sit up. To sleep, he said. I still have four hours before I gotta get up. She nodded and stood up. Then the thought struck him. Six years of living just a hallway away from each other had muddled the fact that she, quite frankly, shouldn't be here. What's going on? Why are you here? He asked. She marched into his kitchen as she answered. Because I did not wish to be home. He frowned. Is it that bad? No. She assured but it will be eventually. He saw her pause, hesitate, it was barely perceptible but he caught it anyway. I was, hoping. His mind drew up the end of her sentence, the pieces clicking into place. You can stay here. He answered, then he frowned. Though, you should probably tell Sasuke where. No. She interrupted. He will be upset. But if I tell him he might have to tell father. And if that happens your kindness will be rewarded with more trouble than I'm worth I'm afraid. I'll explain such to him. He'll understand. Your dad might put the pieces together eventually. Naruto commented. In his mind, better to just get it over with. There was little he had to fear from Uchiha Fugaku. He'd faced far worse Uchiha than some puffed up pseudo politician. Then let him. No need for either of us to do his dirty work for him. There was a distinct edge of bitterness there and he wisely decided to drop the subject. He got off the bed, marching over to his old couch with his pillow and flopping down on its surface. There was a silence with Itachi in his kitchen and him trying to push away the memories his nightmares had drug up to try and ease himself back to sleep. Minutes later she was standing in front of him, holding a cup by its rim smoke rising to coil between her fingers and continue its upward path. Thanks. He smiled as he took it from her. You don't have to leave me your bed. Naruto waved her off. This might be for an extended period Naruto. Don't worry about it. He slurped, loudly. I'm always glad to help. And yet you won't let me help you, she said pointedly. He stiffened the smile falling off his lips. We already talked about this, he said, frowning. Then we will speak again, she said flatly. I won't let you hunt your masked man alone Naruto. 
The faux 12 year old sat up, another memory coming through. The one of the day he'd really messed up. Zero. He'd left the castle, wandered, almost aimlessly that day. He'd woken up screaming in sheer pandemonium. One of Koto's guard had found him, held him down, defended himself until he'd come to his senses. Even so, by the time others came he'd managed to actually cut the man's forearm, a fact that had astounded everyone. It wasn't second-rate ninja that were assigned to the daimyo's personal guard. When he finally calmed enough, under the thrall of a genjutsu of another of the daimyo's guard the others had questioned him, some with worry, others with wary seriousness. Koto had sat beside him in a way he would imagine a grandfather may have, speaking softly, never confrontational. When they asked, he said he didn't remember. They didn't believe him. None of them did. He'd seen it on their faces plain as day. But Koto's kindness had saved him as he ushered them all out of the room, bidding him a good night with an open invitation to speak later if he wished. He hid himself away that day, all but fled the palace. He'd sought isolation as he felt himself coming apart at the seams. He had nightmares before. They ranged, from memories, to fears, to simple emotions. He'd never had a nightmare of them though. Never of Team 7. He heard Sakura's final goodbye, saw Sasuke ripped to shreds, relived the experience of feeling Kurama fading away to nothingness. Then he remembered the silence. That unending silence, that nothingness. The crushing pressure of solitude that so easily fractured his mind time after time. The memory was as fresh as if it had just been an hour ago. He wanted to join them. To literally curl up into a ball and let the whole world go to hell again. And it was only the knowledge that they sent him back, that they did everything, and put every faith on him to save them this time around that had kept him from ending this whole, miserable charade right then and there. She found him that way. That is, she'd chosen to make her presence known at that point. She didn't say a word, and he'd spotted her the second she let him. He'd wiped at his eyes, trying to get himself under control again. He tried to smile. Tried to pull out that old, well-worn grin that came so easily whenever he needed it. It failed him now. It slipped through his fingers like sand through a net as he asked if she was okay. If she was okay. Meanwhile he was falling to pieces. She walked closer to him and Naruto trembled shaking like a leaf where he was, emotions roiling through his fragmented thoughts. Come here Naruto. She'd requested, holding out her hand. And he cried. The bottled up mess of emotions he'd been throwing behind activity, duty and distraction since the moment he arrived burst open. And he couldn't stop himself no matter how hard he tried, to say that he was okay. To throw them all back behind that wall. The one step he managed to take towards her expended the last of his strength and he'd have fallen flat on his face if she hadn't caught him. He clutched at her like a drowning man clings to the tethered rope that leads to shore, he sobbed into her clothes, and apologized. Over and over he whispered he was sorry. She never once interrupted him, never questioned. She sat patiently, rubbing her hand across his hair. When the worst of it had passed, when the hysterical tears were reduced to sniffles and the occasional hiccuping sob then she asked, with a voice so gentle one would never imagine it to belong to the young woman who had plotted a scant year before to kill her entire family. What do you wish to say Naruto? And so he'd told her. He told her everything. Who he was. What had happened, what was going to happen, who Toby was, how he'd gotten here. How he'd failed everyone. He told her everything, everything he could everything he remembered. She said nothing. She would say nothing for a long time. She lifted him, carrying his eight-year-old body back to the palace, carefully avoiding the Anbu patrols before placing him back into his room. She said nothing, the hours turned to days and the days to weeks. She gave herself time. She absorbed everything as slowly and as detached as she could in order to determine whether he was mad or if it could, miraculously, be the truth, she was determined to not give in to a knee-jerk reaction. All of the pieces, the little nuances, the oddities, the abnormalities, the absurdities, and the circumstances, all, one by one, clicking to place in her mind. The centerpiece that had been missing, bringing it all together in her thoughts. When she approached him again, she asked, quite plainly What is your plan to find the masked man? Zero. As liberating as it had been, as great of a relief it may have felt like, to have someone else he could speak to, someone who believed him despite everything, he still regretted it he still wished there was a way to make her forget. Toby was, Toby. As strong as Itachi is, as strong as Itachi was. Itachi was no match for Toby. He knew this. 
he'd seen it firsthand. Even he, the strongest Jinchuriki, nay, the strongest ninja that had ever been was still unable to take him down. At the beginning, he might have won. But as more and more were killed and turned, as Toby learned more and more, absorbed more and more power, there came a time where they'd been matched blow for blow and with the weight of numbers and a tireless army at his back, it simply couldn't have ended any other way but in their loss and Toby's victory. He didn't want her, his friend now more than what his version of Itachi had been, to get herself killed in a well-meaning attempt to help. I said no. He barked. I'm not gonna let you get yourself killed. That isn't up to you. I could die to your masked man just the same as I could die on a normal mission. At least in this way I will be doing something far more useful. Naruto frowned, detesting the calm little drawl she always spoke in now more than ever before. Toby is more dangerous than anything else you'll find on a mission. Just let me do things my way. Once I become a hunter nin. You won't. He grit his teeth. I'm. Strong enough, perhaps. She interrupted again. If only just. But more than that Sarutobi Sama won't let you. You won't be a hunter nin. Why wouldn't he? Do you think I was the only one that suspected to your instability? Do you think I was the only one that pointed out strange events to him? That brought things to his attention? Your loyalty to the village is unquestioned, but your mental health is far from being above reproach. The hunter nin must be beyond question in body, loyalty and mind. You aren't. Not to mention the sentimental reasons for him. He cast his eyes down, looking away. His grip on the cup was tight, he was glad she'd gotten a strong one, else he might have broken it already. She knelt, seeking out his gaze. You can't become a hunter nin as you are now. I can. Let me help you Naruto. You can't carry the world on your shoulders. No, no he couldn't. He tried once. And it cost him everyone. Have you spoken to Sasuke? Or to this Sakura girl? He kept quiet, closing his eyes. If I were to ask, would they even know your name? She didn't wait for an answer. Saving your friends would mean nothing if all you held after Toby's death was the feel of his blood on your hands. Her hand came up, quickly bringing his eyes towards her own. Let me help. Tell me what your plan was once you became a hunter, where would you search, who you would question, I'll find you your masked man Naruto. He closed his eyes and he almost felt like crying again as he admitted. I don't want to lose another friend Itachi. You won't. She swore. I promise you that if nothing else. He looked away, hesitating. Go back to your friends Naruto. She, pleaded this time. He could tell the difference between it and a lecture by now. Do you think you're Sakura? or your Sasuke would wish to know that they were truly leaving you alone when they sent you here. That's, a really low blow you know. This time he wiped at his eyes. She remained quiet. Either out of courtesy or an apology, maybe a bit of both. Let me. He took a breath. Can I sleep for now? We'll talk about it again tomorrow okay? Her gaze softened ever so slightly. Of course. Zero. He woke up a handful of hours later. Itachi was still asleep. Packing all of her stuff into scrolls without her parents finding out must have worn her out more than she'd let on. He was grateful for the time that gave him. To think. To clear his head. It wasn't a conversation he was relishing the thought of having to be honest. Quietly he slipped out of the apartment, leaving a note behind saying he was headed towards the tower for a team assignment. He wasn't lying. He did promise that they'd discuss it again. He made his way through the morning bustle, winding between the crowds and cutting through that market bazaar he didn't quite recall from his own time as he made his way to the tower. When he arrived, Kyofu was there, all but lounging on a bench, her lizard summon coiled around her neck and shoulders. Hi Naruto. She smiled, though it soon suffered a bit. You look. Tired as hell? He grinned. Didn't get a good sleep last night. It'll be okay. She nodded, scratching at her summon beneath its chin. Say hello Ko. The beast opened a ruby red eye, swiveling it around to face him. Its forked tongue slipped out once. Then it went back to sun bathing on his summoner. She sighed. Lazy, what do I keep you for? You know, you never did tell me how you got more than one summon contract. Naruto frowned. I didn't think that was actually possible. It is. She smiled. A lot of ninja don't get summons until after they're older and already have a few techniques under their belt. She admitted. So most just pick up one and keep doing what they've been doing. Since I got started so early, 
that left me with an advantage of basically being a blank slate. As for summons allowing you to have more than one contract, yeah, it's tough. Summons are very particular about the people they let summon them. And there are rivalries, bitter ones between groups. You will never, ever, ever find the slugs and snakes under a single summoner. Katsuyu hates Manda and vice versa. The same can be said of many other summon clans. You have to find clans that can tolerate one another, or at least don't know each other that well to have rivalries. Lizards? Can't stand spiders. Turtles can't stand wolves. Birds, can't really stand anything that walks on the ground but I managed, somehow anyway. She shrugged. At any rate, the advantage is summon animals can specialize in ways that we can't. Most groups of summons only have one elemental affinity, and so can use techniques with that element humans might never be able to dream of. And can counter the affinities of other ninja, nullifying their elemental repertoire almost entirely for the most part. If I'm facing a wind or lightning element, I'll summon my birds, against water or fire I have turtles, with these guys she scratched Ko's scaly side. A taijutsu user will have a pretty hard time getting to me and every summon is good against genjutsu users, well, most. That Itachi girl really threw me for a loop last time. He grinned. Yeah, she's something else huh? Kyofu nodded so. He thought. Earth elementals are the only ones that can get to you? I have a harder time. She admitted then glared at something only she could see. Of course that wouldn't be the case if Sensei just forked over his damn snake contract already. Judging by the slightly mad look lingering beneath those eyes, he decided to avoid this subject. If need be he'd approach it again with a ten-foot pole, held by Kiba, under the influence of Shikamaru's cage mane perhaps. It was at that point, Ryoko decided to join them. If Naruto looked like crap he didn't want to imagine what the hell had happened to her. Are you? Shut up. Too early, coffee. She bit out, all but shambling past him and Kyofu. Tower lobby. The mocha-skinned young woman explained. It has a coffee machine. She's never been a morning person. Ah, he said in acceptance. Minutes later they were sitting in the waiting room for team assignments, having punched in their number they now sat surrounded by several Chonin and Genin teams. Ryoko was nursing a tall plastic cup of coffee in hand as she leaned her head against the wall making him wonder if she was trying to stave off a headache or if she was trying to catch a few extra minutes of sleep somehow. He heard another team approaching from down the hall. His brain took a second to place the familiarity. Lee would you calm down already? But 1010 how can I be calm? We are to receive our mission now. Like we've done four times a week for the past year, yeah, calm down. Was her deadpan response. Stop jumping. The door opened and in walked Lee, 1010 and Neji, the latter had his arms crossed, the other two were talking. Well, one was reprimanding the other was bouncing on the balls of his feet. Keep it down brats. He heard Ryoko all but growl. It's too early for this. It's almost ten, Kyofu chuckled. Ten ten blushed from her cheeks to the tips of her ears. I'm so sorry. Lee is, unique. He was dropped as a child you see, repeatedly. I was? Lee seemed shocked at this newfound knowledge. Nay. Be nice. Naruto poked his silver-haired teammate with the toe of his boot. It's not their fault you suck at waking up in the morning. Kyofu made a sound of amusement somewhere in her throat. She opened one eye, glaring. Naruto grinned and turned his attention back to Guy's team of Genin. Hi. Name's Naruto. He leaned forward in his seat extending his hand. Nice ta meet cha. Ten Ten smiled as she took it, Lee shook it vigorously as well. Neji raised an eyebrow. Naruto? As in the Naruto that was sponsored for early academy enrollment by Orochimaru of the Sanin? Naruto blinked, and it took him a second to remember that it happened and it had been pretty big news at the time. I'm kinda surprised you remembered that. Got yourself a fan club there Naru-chan? This time, Ryoko's tone was dancing with amusement. Neji looked, predictably offended. Hardly. I made it my business to know of potentially strong students in Genin when I was going to enter the academy. Your name came up enough times that it stuck to memory. It's not every day one is set to graduate so early. The blonde opened his mouth to speak when Lee was suddenly in front of him. Naruto-san, he cried, flames dancing in his eyes. Fight me. The mini green beast of Konoha threw a punch. Instinctively, the blonde leaned his head to the side and Lee's fist met the dry wall, boring a visible hole into it as his arm dug in up to the wrist. Then Ten-Ten was pinching his ear, 
twisting it, hard as she snarled out her words. You don't just go around challenging random people to fights you idiot. Ow ow but ten ten Naruto-san is a chonin I must test ow. I swear you were dropped on your head. It's the only explanation. Naruto chuckled under his breath brushing off bits of dry wall from his shoulder. You were not surprised. The words brought his attention back to Neji. He blinked. Huh? You were not surprised. He spoke with eyes narrowed in suspicion. When Lee attacked, you moved but didn't tense up. Even your teammates prepared themselves for a fight, if only just. You however did not. Naruto chuckled, scratching the back of his head. I've met Guy before. So when Lee walked in I kinda knew what I could expect. Who's Guy? Ryoko asked. Taijutsu Master of Konoha. Kyofu answered. I didn't think you were acquainted Naruto. He shrugged and averted his eyes from Neji. It wasn't a lie, not really. The Hayuga's eyes eyes narrowed in suspicion nonetheless, as though he could tell there wasn't quite a full truth in those words. He was saved from further inquiry when another Chonin opened the door. Teammate? Ryoko and Kyofu stood up, and Naruto followed their example, smiling at the Genin team who were his friends. It was nice meeting you all. Ten Ten smiled and offered another apology as she twisted Leezer further. Lee could do little more than plead with her to let go. Neji glared at him. A rueful smile decorated his features as he marched out. They made their way towards the mission briefing room, finding, as per the norm, Chunin administrators going this way and that way, filing paperwork, double-checking rankings, prioritizing jobs. Ah! The Chunin that seemed to be in charge of handing out missions smiled as he caught sight of them. Good. You guys are perfect, he declared. Perfect for what? Kyofu asked with a suspicious, raised eyebrow. The man rummaged through various mission scrolls, searching for a specific one. Aha! He smirked, pulling out one in particular. He tossed it and Ryoko caught it, holding up the scroll with a big B branded on its edge. This one needs the velvet glove. The Chonin smirked. You'll be escorting one of our Jounin to go and broker a deal with Kiri. Those bloody mist types only respect strength. Sending just the Jounin would be insulting but neither can we afford to send and lose a full squad of Chonin, or an escort team of three Jounin for what should be a glorified blue milk run for three to four months. But you guys are Chonin that trained under Orochimaru. You're not average Chonin. So no insult and you're not quite as high on the needed on priority missions list as a team of Jounin such as to really do us harm in the long term by sending you on a diplomat's mission. This mission was tailor-made for you guys. Ryoko opened the scroll reading through it, Kyofu and Naruto joined her. Naruto's mind was focused only on one thing though. The time frame of three to four months. More and more it seemed, he would have to put Itachi in the firing line, put her squarely in Toby's path. He took a deep, calming breath through his nostrils. Elsewhere, at that moment in the tower, Hiruzen smoked his pipe as he read the solicitation form laid out before him. He placed it back on his desk. This seems rather soon. He drawled. You only just returned. Things at home are, irritating. She answered. I would rather leave before it escalated. Joining the Hunter Nin isn't something done just to get away from home Itachi Chan. He answered seriously. She nodded. I am aware of that. This is something that I have been considering for quite some time though. Long before we returned even. It was my intention to join eventually. This latest development has just sped up my plans by a handful of months at best. Hiruzen closed his eyes thinking. Your loyalty after what you did for us, and were willing to do years ago, is beyond question as far as I'm concerned. A full battery of tests, medical, psychological and otherwise will await you if you choose to proceed. If all goes well, and everything comes up alright, you will be assigned your duties as a hunter within one month's time. Does that suit you? The question was more out of courtesy than anything. The Hokage didn't ask if something this big was to your liking you took it, or you left it as is. That will be fine, she said. He nodded, taking the solicitation and placing it in the stack of papers to be stamped, signed and filed. Somehow I have a feeling you'll do well in this Itachi. She nodded. I'm glad you agree with me Hokage-sama. Zero. By the time she returned to her new, temporary home in Naruto's apartment, he was already packing for the trip. Laying supplies, clothes and weapons across several scrolls in order to seal them. She stood at the edge of the wall that marked the entrance of his room of his studio, waiting patiently for him to speak. Finally, 
as he finished arranging the items his shoulders slumped. You, there really is no other way for me to do this is there? He asked, not looking at her. Not in any way that lets me stay loyal to the village that is. She frowned. You've considered becoming a missing nin? Naruto chuckled, the sound was bitter and harsh. You don't want to know what I've considered doing. The frown deepened. She looked at him, a mirror image of herself staring back at her, of a desperate child clinging to the last threads of brittle hope and feeling them snapping one after another leaving them to fall into that gaping abyss that yawned just beneath their feet. He was the lifeline that had once stopped her from doing something, terrible. And here he was, torturing himself because he wanted so desperately to accept the lifeline she offered in return, her help. But hating all of the implications of doing so. She stepped forward, and just the same as the night before, she knelt in front of him, hands rising to rest on his shoulders. You know that they wouldn't want to see you like this. Hurting yourself. Please. He took a deep, slow breath. Let me help you. He said nothing. For an interminable moment she feared as though he wouldn't answer. That he had chosen to retreat into that shell of silence and stubborn refusal again. The sudden jerk of his head seemed like a twitch, a spasm. It was only when he repeated the motion, more decisively did she see it as a nod. She released a breath she hadn't known herself to be holding. I. He cleared his throat hesitating for one last time before he forced himself to continue. I was going to begin my search in Amiga Core. Chapter 22. The room was clean, sterile. She sat on a reclined chair, eyes closed against the harsh glare of the light that hung directly overhead, dark hair spread out behind her like a curtain of midnight, her hands resting, relaxed, on the armrests as she listened and answered. When did you become a Chonin? The examiner questioned. When I was seven. Why? I'm afraid I don't understand your question. Do you inquire as to the means or the reason I chose to become a Chonin? Means. It was a standard Chonin examination. It was held in Suna. My team fared against Suna Genin, one, their leader, was a puppeteer. I caught him in an illusion when our names were called in the waiting area. From the onset, I dictated the entire fight. He expended his energy and arsenal and couldn't coordinate his teammates. Those seconds of confusion early on allowed us to neutralize one of the Genin quickly. From there it was simple. I was promoted for my skill and illusions and my foresight to not wait for the match to be called. You cheated then. From a point of view. She drawled. He scribbled down more on his notepad. He knew the answer to every question, she knew. And most of his responses were meant to evoke some response or other from her, from annoyance and anger, to amusement and nostalgia. How long were you in the Anbu? Nearly seven years. Did you enjoy it? At times. When did you join? When I was eight. Why? This time I'm inquiring as to the reason for accepting rather than the means. He knew every answer already she had to remind herself. I wish to get away from my clan. That's your reason for looking to become a hunter ninja as well correct? She schooled herself as best she could, tried to remain as stoic and calm as she could. She'd closed her eyes at the start of this examination in order to not give anything away through her obsidian gaze when it came to this. There were at least three people in this room. Only one of which she could see or sense, every one of them was a master at rooting out a lie. It is. It took a long, long moment before she heard the scratch of his pen on the little pad of his. Why do you hate your father so much? You said at the beginning I could choose to not answer one of your questions at any time. I would like to exercise that right now if at all possible. It is, he said and she heard the scratch of the pen again. Why did you plan on killing him not so long ago? Not him specifically. She clarified. The entire clan. He just so happened to be part of it. Why did you wish to kill your whole family? He sounded admirably nonplussed by the question. She even heard him take a sip of water as though bored. It would have been the best way to protect Sasuke. She answered truthfully. So Sasuke wasn't on your hit list? No. He would have been the last surviving Uchiha. A tragedy. Precious and protected within the village. Ah, and you the quiet little martyr that butchered everyone. It wasn't a question. So she deigned not to answer. Would you kill them all today if a similar situation came up? No. What reason do you have for the change? She opened her staring at the harsh glare of the overhead bulb. Naruto. She answered truthfully. 
It took another long moment before she heard him scratch something out on the pad and then write something else. Zero. It's not the heat it's the humidity. Whomever had said such a thing before was clearly someone that had been thinking of Kirigakur. The village of the hidden mist lived up to its name. Mist permeated the landscape at almost all hours of the day. The only time that was relatively free of the gloomy moisture was from noon till around 3 or 4. Being an archipelago of tiny islands the constant kiss of the sea ensured that the villages, hamlets and communities would forever be enshrouded by the enveloping fog. Moreover it made certain that they were forever trapped in the sweltering heat. The steam that oozed off the rocky shoals and permeated the space between the islands was like stepping into a sauna. The largest of the islands was the seat of the daimyo. The shinobi made do in the smaller spits of dirt that surrounded it. Interconnected by ferries and bridges where they could be. Any army that tried to invade here would have a monumental hard time. The islands were a maze of natural barriers, man-made traps, ambush sites and narrow choke points. He would know. He'd helped defend this place for the better part of two years. The brine of the ocean whooshed up the side of the ship, pelting his face lightly as he sat on the deck. The sea was choppy this close to so many shores, but relatively calm otherwise. The day was bright and not a single grey cloud could be seen overhead. It was, nice. After he, Sasuke and Sakura constructed the seals, the sun hadn't shown itself over Kirigakura again. Perpetually blocked out by the storm clouds that had fueled the violent whirlpools that acted as another layer of protection. He never knew Kiri could be this pretty to be around. The small boat was manned by five, it had two decks, one above for travel, the one below for transport slash storage there were no rooms and Naruto had only spied a handful of sleeping bags stuffed into a corner below. It was the third boat they'd gotten on to reach the village proper after having arrived from the mainland. Ryoko was looking this way and that way, almost fascinated by the sight of the ocean. She'd become almost instantly enamored with Kiri. The sheer stone Mesa Islands, topped with green at their summits crystal clear blue waters and a unique architecture that could only be found here, floating towns, houses held over the ocean by beams of wood, all came together to enchant the silver-haired Chonin that had never even seen the ocean before this. Kyofu though. They're their lass. Worst part's over. Nothing but dry heaves now. You'll be okay. She might have enjoyed it too if not for her, problem. The elderly captain patted her gently on the back, holding her raven hair out of the way. Naruto offered a smile of apology as his teammate collapsed on a chair that had been provided for her to sit next to the edge. Ugh. The summoner groaned miserably. Naruto scratched under Ko's chin. The lizard had abandoned his summoner when the retching and the smell had annoyed him enough. The scaly hide beast now sat itself on Naruto's shoulder, its head down to rest at the juncture of his arm and collarbone. She doesn't look so good huh buddy? The lizard seemed to yawn giving no outward indication that he cared for either his summoner or Naruto's touch. Ryoko peeled herself away from the edge of the ship, marching over and throwing her arm around Kyofu. You'll be okay KY. We're only a few minutes out of the village now. Uck. Just kill me and wake me up when we get there. She all but sobbed in misery. Naruto chuckled and turned his attention towards their jounin charge. Uzuki Yuagao was a woman he remembered, vaguely at any rate. But he did remember her as an Anbu, not a jounin. Much less a jounin diplomat. He wondered for a moment what exactly had changed that would alter her previously chosen profession. Currently, she had her face stuffed in a book. Is it interesting? He called. It took a second before she realized she was being addressed. She looked up, brow quirking. Excuse me? Is it interesting? He repeated with a smile. Your book. Oh. Yes. She answered with her own, more subdued smile. It revolves around Fuyu Ninjutsu. It's describing some theoretical uses for it. That made Naruto perk up. There was no one alive today that could match him in seals he would be able to forget more than people knew of the art. Oh, let me see, he exclaimed, standing so quickly he heard Ko hiss in his ear. She smirked. Interested in Fuyu Ninjutsu I take it? More than interested. It had taken some careful maneuvering and lies to be able to practice it out in the open within the daimyo's palace. Picking up a beginner's manual, and requesting more books that, ultimately, got more things wrong than they did right, but soon enough he was professed by others to be passable in the art and from passable to a prodigy for his age. It was smooth sailing from there as he allowed himself to experiment every now and again with new seal designs like he used to, with the instructors and odd passerby shrugging it off as him and his eccentricities. 
most were relieved that he was devoting his time to that as opposed to his usual pranks and so were content to leave him be. She tilted the book to him, letting him see. No doubt expecting him to lose interest quickly. He was not, by reputation or practice, the most patient of people, and it took a lot of patience to comprehend and apply Fuyu Ninjutsu. He frowned and couldn't help the words from sputtering out of his mouth. Huh? This is all wrong. She raised a slender eyebrow. Halfway between incredulity and mocking. Naruto-san. This book was written by one of Sunagakura's foremost practice owners in the field. No. This book was written by a hack. He scoffed. This doesn't even have half the style of Suna's seals. If I had to place it it'd be a ramshackle of Kumo and Kuza. More Kuza than Kumo. He's talking about using seals to intercept or absorb attacks but all this is is a beefed up storage seal. He quite literally plucked the book out of her hand and sat himself down reading over the notes with a displeased frown, all but ignoring Yu Gao's own irritated expression. He began muttering to himself as he leafed through the pages. I was unaware sealing had been part of your curriculum. She drawled, her hands lacing together to rest over her stomach now that she had nothing to occupy them. Yeah princess you hiding any more tricks? Sensei's good at seals. Kyofu groaned. Maybe you two can discuss one that cures seasickness. Naruto thought. Now that wouldn't work. Seals in biology aren't usually things that can be mixed unless it's using the chakra network as a medieval weight, was that rhetorical? Ryoko snorted out a bark of laughter that quickly developed into a snicker as Kyofu groaned in miserable discomfort. We're here. The captain called, and the Konoha Nin were treated to the sight of Kirigakur. The village sat at the base of a gorge. As if the gods themselves had carved out a niche for the village to rest in, cradled on three sides by a sheer cliff and open to the welcoming arms of the sea at the fourth rather than a monument that might collapse over their heads with the constant rain that made the earth too soft to safely carve out some big faces, the village instead had statues forged out of pure iron. Each one half the size of the tower and standing at the backdrop of the village, they were in some ways, even more impressive than the traditional monument faces. With its blue hanging tarps providing shade over the homes and the extensive docks that dominated the village in trance it was a unique sight. Minutes later the boat was docking as Kyofu waited on shore, the girl had all but jumped off the boat the second they were within sight of the village in her desperation to reach dry land. The second their boots hit the dock, there was an onbu there, one that hadn't been there before. Follow. The masked ninja demanded before swiftly turning on his heel without another word. The Konoha Nin shared a look before shrugging and doing as requested after collecting Kyofu who was laying on the village beach. Zero. Shimura Danzo was not a man that was easily confused or surprised, and such held true today. When he was summoned to the daimyo's residence within the village's mind had already drawn up nearly a dozen potential reasons for such. He marched through the hallways, following one of Koto's samurai guard with soft clicks of his cane and pats of his socked feet on the polished hardwood. The guard reached a door, stood beside it, bowed to him and then slid open the door. This way please. Thank you. Donzo drawled before stepping into the room, revealing to his gaze the indoor jade dragon fountain. It was a beautiful sculpture. Made entirely of jade and gold, engraved across the length and breadth of the whole wall. It was a dragon, holding its hand aloft, so high one could only see the back of the hand and the detailed knuckles. Water was flowing between its talons to fall onto the three-dimensional carving of the village symbol below it. At the base of that symbol, displayed in a tile mural where the water pooled in its basin was the heraldry of the daimyo's house. Opulent, but a necessary trapping to mark the great alliance that had been formed between Koto's grandfather and Shadaim Hokage so many years ago. Now it sat overlooking a table where a tea set was laid out, awaiting those who would be using it. He placed himself down knowing his host wouldn't keep him waiting long. He was proven right of course. Koto entered first, and to his mild displeasure, but expectation, Sarutobi followed right after, white robes and hat firmly in place. The Sandaime's presence removed at least seven of the possibilities he'd deduced to be the reason for his summons here. Donzo. Koto opened his arms, almost as if in preparation for a hug when Donzo held his hand out, long before the daimyo made it close enough for such and Koto smoothly adjusted his movement to shake his hand with both of his instead. Forgive me for being late my friend. He wasn't. Donzo was just ten minutes early as per his preference, it was gracious of the man to pretend otherwise though. Consider nothing of it. The war hawk replied turning to look at Sarutobi. Hiruzen. Shimura. Their greeting was cool, but cordial, as usual. 
Donzo noticed the daimyo's guard captain closing the door behind him, the twin swords at his side. Rahman, if he recalled correctly. The bright orange and green robes, full of foreign-styled embroidery seemed almost garishly out of place. Koto gestured towards the table, leading them both to it. Come. Come. Let's have some tea. And so the three most powerful men in Hai no Kuni, sat down and enjoyed a perfectly herb jasmine tea. There was silence between them for several minutes. Sarutobi was the one that broke it. This is very good. He praised. One of my guilty pleasures. Koto admitted with a shame smile. I order boxes of these from Kumo. Prohibitively expensive really. Forgive me. Donzo finally drawled, placing his now empty cup down. But perhaps the nuances of tea should be put aside for the time being. Yes, yes I'm sorry. Koto's smile could have been called nervous by another eye. I just heard, jasmine tea tends to make people more receptive to incorrigibly stupid ideas, he chuckled. Donzo raised a bushy eyebrow, Hiruzen mimicking him. He wasn't a man easily confused or surprised. That pitch did throw him a bit though. Zero. Tsunade and Mei differed in many aspects of ruling the village Naruto had learned during his original life, and could tell that much of what he knew was still, by and large, true, or at least seemed to be at first glance. Tsunade, despite her propensity for drinking on the job, was in fact, a control freak and a perfectionist. As much as she complained and bitched about her paperwork, she read every single document from top to bottom, through all the fine print and technical jargon. It was because she did that, and did it day in and day out without pause that she could be found sleeping at her desk so often. Why she had such a huge backlog of papers. But she demanded everything be sent through her first and foremost. He suspected, in his cheap psychoanalysis 101 education he'd received from the University of Goddamn and Nowhere, that it had to do with Dan and her brother's deaths. Since those missions, that had gone completely off the rocker, she either a, never wanted that to happen under her watch or b, wanted absolute control of everything around her if she could have it. Maybe a bit of both. She checked and double-checked everything so that nothing like that, or his mission to wave, would ever happen again. May however, was a younger woman, one whose life, while violent as all shinobi lives, was not nearly as riddled with missteps and traumas as Tsunade's. So she was far more comfortable delegating work to others and primarily dealt with things that were strictly above the rank and file business aspects. She worked on the A ranks and above, little more. Everything else was delegated to someone she trusted to manage their branch and report at the end of the month accurately. A demotion or employment termination would be the least of the person's worries if they were caught lying to her about something in said reports. So while Tsunade's desk would have been in a state of chaotic order, full of papers, pens, files, sticky notes and such, along with a mildly rushing Tsunade that would have been quite impatient about something or other. May's desk was virtually pristine. As if they just took it out of its case five minutes before they had arrived and placed a small stack of papers into an appropriate tray and May herself was quite content and languid in her approach, going through pleasantries and inquiring as to their trip. She even remembered them though she had apologized for not remembering their names. The meeting had worn on for almost an hour before the woman leaned forward at her desk. As pleasant as this has been she said. I believe we should get down to it. This must be the third time Ryoko-san has looked out my balcony as though she wants to jump. The silver-haired girl snapped her gaze over to the smirking woman, actually blushing in embarrassment as she removed her gaze from said balcony to do so. I know I. May chuckled, waving away her apology. Yuagao shot the kunoichi a vaguely reprimanding look out the corner of her eye before she reached into her pocket. Here you are. These are the terms Sarutobi-sama would need to have met in order to agree to this trade proposal. Along with the alterations made to your own requests. I assure you that I am within full capacity to speak on behalf of the village regarding the contents within this scroll. Translation. I have my orders regarding these things. Don't try to add something new, else wise will be here for quite a bit longer as I await word from the Hokage. Naruto thought to himself. He was curious about what the actual terms were though. He'd like to know why he was dragged out here for a few months in order to help you a gal. Oh well. Curiosity killed the cat but satisfaction brought him back. Using some of his well-learned stealth and speed, Naruto slithered around the desk like the sensei he disliked so much and, before anyone could really react he was peeking his 12-year-old head over the edge of the desk to grab a look-see of what Mei was now reading over. Naruto, Yuagao hissed. The blonde grinned and let his eyes skim over the document, as quickly as possible. Just in case it was removed from his sight too quickly. 
He felt a hand ruffling his hair and grinned. It paid to be cute and twelve sometimes. Curious are you? May made a hum of amusement somewhere in her throat. She kept reading, and while she made no move to angle the scroll down to him for him to not have to crane his neck quite so much, neither did she remove it from his side or order him to be removed from her side. Yua Gao looked like she was going to give him a stern talking to when they got out though. He was just getting to the part that was outlining the modifications to Kiri's own requests and terms when suddenly. Ahead. Literally, ahead, bloody and slack-jawed with at least a day's decomp setting in was thrown onto the desk making everyone jump. Clumps of half-coagulated, black blood were now spattered across the polished surface in a disgusting display. Naruto caught sight of the face for half a second before his gaze was blotted out. He blinked, confused at the sudden darkness. Then he realized May had covered his eyes. One overhyped nuke nin delivered. A familiar voice drawled. Seriously, are you guys just giving those bingo book markings away? Last time I checked A ranks were like Zabuza-chan, they could actually make me try in order to kick their asses into the ground. I am in a meeting you braindead fish, May hissed, not at all pleased to have the head of a bounty literally dumped on her desk. One which has no doubt been made vastly more interesting by my fabulous presence. Naruto couldn't help the snicker that fought its way past his teeth despite the identity of the owner of said voice. There was a scrape, and a thud and Naruto realized May must have slid the head off the desk to let it fall in the waste bin just to the side. Anbu-san, forgive me since it's not part of your duties but would you be so kind as to take out the trash. One of the faceless, masked men appeared and a second later May's hand came off his eyes, revealing the bewildered faces of his comrades, May's irritated profile and, of course the shark-like grin of Hoshigate Kisame standing at the balcony ledge. The shark man turned to look over the room, eyes fixating on Ryoko's distinctive weapon. Hey! I recognize that. Weren't you that little brat that could barely even swing straight a couple of years ago? Ryoko leaned back in her chair somewhat offended at both his description and his lack of memory. May had never met her, but Kisame had trained with her for a month. Don't know. Were you the overgrown seven-foot-tall tuna I remember? The grin widened a bit. Careful little girl. Once you're down and I'll no longer consider it in poor taste to kick your sorry ass across the village. Kisame. May bit out. These are the negotiators from Konoha. Would you mind if we continue? Why not at all? He sat himself down on the railing. Don't mind me. I'll just be adding my delightful commentary every now and again. May closed her eyes, counted back from twenty before she looked to Yuagao. Forgive me, truly. Might we adjourn this for today while I deal with, this? It is no trouble. Yuagao answered with a polite nod. Ah, but I only just got here. May pointedly ignored him. My assistant will show you to your rooms within the village. Once again I apologize. As they left Naruto just caught the venomous glare May threw onto her balcony before the door slammed shut. Luckily for him, his bad manners in peeking over May's shoulder as it were, was vastly overshadowed by Kisame's little head on desk thing. So the lecture Yuagao had been prepping was cut to the equivalent of a short don't do it again. And that was that. Zero. Donzo wished that something far stronger than jasmine tea was in his cup right now. The only relief he felt is that Hiruzen looked about as thrilled about the idea as he himself did. Koto's smile was apologetic. Hiruzen cleared his throat, placing his cup down. The old monkey laced his hands together, raised one leg over the other as he leaned back in his chair. Years ago when you requested tutors to train Rai Outenbin's granddaughter I acquiesced to your request even though I stated it was a bad idea. This new notion you've cooked up makes me feel downright comfortable with having taught her so much by comparison. You wish. Donzo drawled. For us to, open our doors to Iwagakur? He normally wasn't one that required explanation, but he had to be clear on this. Just to be certain the man had utterly lost his wits. As in, allow a group of Chonin, their Chonin, free entrance into the village? To foster them here for a number of years? Koto nodded. Hiruzen, for all his tender-heartedness was rather direct this time as he spoke. You may want peace Koto-sama. But placing the nail over your skull and guiding the hand of the person holding the hammer is hardly the best approach for obtaining it. The daimyo sighed and spoke again. I do not wish for us to be enemies. I do not wish for us to constantly have five times the guards and outposts on our northern borders as we do everywhere else. I do not wish for instant enmity between us whenever we merely happen upon each other on the road. Things should not continue like this. And one of us must be willing to put down the shield to grasp at the olive branch and hold it out first. 
Then let it be them, Donzo said flatly. You've fostered his granddaughter, got us to teach her our techniques, our skills and you're giving her back to Ryotenbin with neither hide nor hair missing. You have already done more than what was prudent. Any further and you will stumble onto the realms of pure folly. Anaki still sees my taking his granddaughter as my taking a hostage. Koto answered simply. She is a treasure I stole from under him in his eyes. It is not enough. It will have to be, Hiruzen said flatly. I refuse to agree to this request. This goes too far and endangers too many for the mere possibility that Iwagakura might decide to entertain the idea of peace as opposed to a perfect opportunity to hit us where we're least protected. The answer is no. And Donzo felt the weight as the gauntlet had been thrown down. He straightened where he sat. A moment of shared solidarity with Hiruzen. The precarious balance of power between the daimyo and the cage of Hai no Kuni had never been defined, never been laid out. Each side understood their respective roles, the limits to their own authority. The daimyo sustained the village gave them all they needed to thrive. The village acted as his shield and sword. Neither side ever demanded too much from the other. Because the moment this measured balancing act of tradition and respect was thrown askew the whole system might be irrevocably damaged, shifted as it happened in Suna, Iwa, and Kiri. Koto was pushing those boundaries now. And Sarutobi was in turn, pushing right back by denying the request of the village's primary benefactor. Without the daimyo's support, the village would be logistically unsustainable. Without the village, the daimyo would be a prime easy target. Koto took a deep breath through his nostrils, the lines of his face growing harder. Measured. His eyes closed. How can a simple man like me? He breathed after a long moment of quiet. Make great changes in this world, if the great men that live in it won't stand beside me? He recognized those words. Anyone who even held a passing interest in history would. They were the words engraved onto the greatest tomb their village had ever erected. Etched onto a wooden door that could not be broken by any force beneath that of an S-class technique. Hashirama said those words to two people first. One was my grandfather. The other was Uchiha Madara. He was pleading with them to give him their men, their families, their resources. All to create the system of government that would bring an end to the constant fighting that had soaked this land in blood for nearly three centuries beforehand. His smile was sad again. It was a desperate plan. Full of dangers, of holes and was born out of an idealistic hope more than anything. And he asked them to help him. And even though, there were dangers, even though all previous attempts at coalitions and alliances had collapsed before this event with infighting and petty squabbles they chose to put their faith in the ideal. And the endless wars came to an end. You wish to draw comparisons then? Donzo drawled. Do you think what you're doing now is no different to what he did nearly a century ago? There is a difference between the two of you though. Hashirama had the raw power, the capacity to push his dreams through sheer might Koto-sama. When he and Madara stepped onto the field there was no force in the world that could destroy them. The alliance of seventeen clans were the ones that came closest but in the end, they too were swept aside. You are not Hashirama. No one is. Hiruzen conceded, his eyes closed as he listened to the both of them. Koto looked to the both of them and that sad, pleading smile was still there. You're right Donzo. I'm not Hashirama. I could not defeat Rai Outenbin, if not for the Genin, children that had been with me years ago when I took Kurotsuchi, I may very well be dead, he chuckled. How can a simple man like me make great changes in this world, if the great men that live in it will not stand beside me? He repeated. Hiruzen looked as though he was torn between wanting to throttle the man and wanting to lecture him as one would a child. Donzo kept his features as impassive as possible. The locked jaw however, gave away his own tension. We will discuss this at another time. Sarutobi finally broke the ensuing silence standing up the Hokage bode formally. I'm afraid I've stayed longer than I should have already. And this conversation will still require much time. Donzo stood as well, offering his own bow. They did have the courtesy in mind to wait for Koto's leave to proceed with exiting however. Zero. They'd been given an absolutely gorgeous beach home to stay in. Three stories, six rooms, three bathrooms, a training area facing the ocean with a balcony on the second story. It was without a doubt a beautiful home. No doubt it was used to host visiting Daimyo or Cage when the Chonin exam was being hosted in Kiri. That's it, I'm defecting. I'm sorry my teammates but this is it. I'm staying here forever. There's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. Ryoko called from where she lay on a hammock, swinging this way and that way. The hiss of the ocean in the background served to accent the statement. 
you won't be able to ogle that Chun Nin and intelligence department anymore, Kyofu laughed. I will learn to survive without the sight of Bay's curly hair and dimple smile, possibly by finding myself a tanned, beach-loving example of sexiness right here. Naruto himself chuckled as he heard them. Laughing at the easy exchange. He caught Yuigao reading her seal's book again and frowned, pointedly making his way over. Put that down, he demanded. That hack's work is gonna get you killed. She snapped the book shut, though her thumb remained hooked on the underside, holding her place. She offered a wry smirk. Evidently with a few cups of wine she was well and truly unwound from the stresses of the day. All right Mr. Tiny Master. What exactly is so wrong with this that has sold thousands and has been used by many ninja? Naruto snorted. Any jackass can take hold of a stick, strike a stance and say he's a swordsman to anyone who doesn't know any better. The smirk got bigger. And slowly, Naruto realized that she was probably thinking those words applied more to himself than her author. I'll tell you what. He challenged, his own smirk lighting up his face. You pick a seal in that book, any seal. You make his version with all the unnecessary garbage he's saying you need, and I'll make my version and we'll see which one does better. And what exactly does the winner get? She reclined on the soft couch. Naruto shrugged. I'm twelve what are you expecting? It was convenient sometimes. She laughed, a quick bark of amusement that reached the other two. I'll take it under advisement then, she said. Zero. To his immense credit, Ramon had the courtesy to wait until his daimyo decided he was good and ready to step out of the room before he opened his mouth to comment. I am thinking this not go so well yes. He couldn't tell if it was a statement or a question, so he answered as he stepped out of the room, struggling to hold in his sigh. It went about as well as could be expected. I am asking that they take a very big risk. It is more risk to hold out arm while other is armed than to be asked to go charging into a fight. In a way. He answered as they marched down the halls. The Chonin could do immense damage. Not in terms of sabotage or even intelligence gathering on our defenses per se, though those two are distinct and very real possibilities but they could convince others to defect, slither in enough to make us hesitate, learn enough to guess what strategies we might use. Warn Iwa if the situation deteriorates rapidly with village relations. There are an innumerable number of ways this could affect them poorly and only the slimmest chance that it might turn out as I hope. Ah. His servant nodded. Then, added after a second. And yet you push it to them anyway. Why? You must start somewhere, he said by way of answer, climbing a set of stairs now, two samurai bowing to him. I did not expect them to accept. Would it have pleased me? Certainly. But I know that the mistrust is simply too deep. You wanted to give them, at least idea of the thing yes? Yes. With this bad idea in mind, when I present another alternative, they will be more receptive, perhaps, if only to return to the comfortable status quo of us not denying each other anything and not disagreeing. I see. His captain of the guard nodded with a smirk. Please excuse but why invite the angry, one-eyed one. He is not cage. No. But Donzo and Hiruzen would argue on whether the night sky was black, or ebony. If I did not include him he would make an already fragile agreement unbearable. Ah yes I see. Koto stepped into the library of his temporary home. It wasn't nearly as extensive as the private rooms he held in his palace. He was not Hashirama. Even Hashirama was not Hashirama. Not the one that they envisioned. Being the pioneer of the shinobi system, the shot I'm Hokage, the man had attained a near deictic status amongst the people of Kanahagakur. In their minds he was the man that had single-handedly unified their land and beat back all the invaders and upstarts that had threatened him. But Hashirama was a man with his own limitations and failings. He was the most powerful man in the world, physically and even then Madara was his equal according to historical text. But he was not a strategist, not a tactician, not a statesman, not an economist, not a builder or a logistics planner. Madara helped him with his strategies, Koto's grandfather had drawn up many of the treaties and agreements, his wife had taken teachings from her home to design the village layout, his uncle and brother had helped hammer out the nuances of the shinobi rankings. Hashirama had been the man with a vision. He needed others to help him shape that vision. He had not carried the world forward on the strength of his own shoulders alone. How can a simple man like me make great changes in the world, if the great men who live in it will not stand beside me? Today the phrase was held as one of humility amongst the Konoha people. Koto held it to mean more of sincerity. No one could do things alone. He had a vision, and he would need the help of many people to bring it about. Hiruzen, 
Donzo, his son Takeshio, Ramon, his guards, his servants, even Anaki and dear Kurotsuchi whom he's come to view as family herself in her own way. He would need their help, much as he might wish to drag them all kicking and screaming if he wished. He only needed to discover how best to convince them all when the time came. He pulled out several scrolls and a few bound books, settling himself in his favorite chair of the residence. I will be here for some time, he said. Don't let me keep you from your duties Ramon. The foreigner bowed, the various jewels of his clothes clinking before he turned and marched out of the room. Chapter 23 Their mornings were criminally banal. Almost domestic really. One of them would wake up before the others, and that person, whoever it was, would be assigned with making breakfast, at least most of them were. Naruto was perfectly content with making and eating ramen for breakfast but after the second day of that, he'd been forbidden from making them breakfast. Ryoko and Yuugao made eggs. Simple, quick, efficient. Kyofu liked to mix it up with other things like steamed rice, or miso soup. Then they'd follow Yuugao to the tower. Or at least one of them did anyway. Their presence here was a show. After day one, show was more or less over for the most part. They were there but they didn't exactly have to be present especially when none of them had something to contribute. So they cycled through the duties one of them would follow every two days then the next and then the next and the cycle would start all over again. The two that didn't follow were free to explore Kirigakura's many charms and attractions. While certainly not a tourist location, being a military village and all, the archipelago Kirigakura called home was the location for many beautiful sights that the ferries and boatmen could point out and show off. Today was Ryoko's turn. Naruto's had been yesterday. So he was already planning to head out with Kyofu if she wanted to join him. They were getting through their breakfast when there was a knock on the door. Curious sets of eyes rose before Naruto hopped off his chair, he still had to hop, damn it, I'll get it. He called, ignoring the kunai blades that slipped into Kyofu's hand, the wind chakra gathered onto the tip of Ryoko's chopstick or the pair of very sharp senbone yugao had stuck in her hair to knot it into a loose bun. He opened the door. The face that greeted him was familiar. Haku-chan, he yelled in a simultaneous greeting, a heads up for the people still seated at the table and for himself. Mostly for himself. She smiled Naruto-kun you groan. That's what she said. Was Ryoko snickering commentary. Naruto scowled. Haku giggled. He stepped aside to let her in. What's up? You didn't think Mei-sama would leave you out here and call it a day did you? It'd be a poor way to treat guests, she said, her voice so sincere he could almost believe she wasn't here as an extra pair of eyes. I'm here to show you all around when you're not on duty. Kiri is very beautiful but without a guide you'll never even see half the things you could. He smiled brightly, very little, if any of it had to be forced despite her status as May's eyes and ears. He was genuinely happy to see her doing well. Ryoko peeked her head around the corner of the entrance hall, eyeing the Yuki clan member up and down as she smirked. You two love birds gonna eat or just catch up in private over there? Why is it that whenever I talk to a girl you go saying she's my girl fiend? The boy griped, frowning heavily at her before he smirked. You jealous or something? Ryoko closed her eyes, sighing as though she were about to divulge some sagely wisdom onto an ignorant child. Naruto Naruto. Don't you know I don't get jealous? If I wanted to take you to bed and play Naughty Academy Sensei with student. I'd just up and do it. And just like that, him still being 12 years old was turned against him in a way he never thought possible. He blushed from his neck all the way up to his ears. Yuugao's sharp bark of laughter nearly drowning out the smack of Kyofu's palm meeting her forehead. Haku giggled, strangely. The blonde cracked an eye open and swiveled it around to look at the blushing Hyotan wielder. A wicked little smile tilted her lips that seemed so utterly alien on her face he couldn't help but find it wrong in the best way. He shook his head to clear it. Puberty and hormones was not something he was looking forward to going through again. He prayed it hadn't decided to start early this time around. Ryoko, he was certain, would not be a help when it did. They marched into the dining room, with Yuugao sporting a smirk and Ryoko a shit-eating grin. Hakusan. Kyofu smiled, pushing away her exasperation with her teammate as she extended her hand. It's nice to see you again. Haku nodded as she shook her hand. Six years. You're in our bingo books now you know? That made Ryoko look, a whistle and a smile fighting over control of her lips. No shit? Haku nodded, taking the last seat at the table. Yes. You're listed as, individually, low B rank. Very high for Chonin. 
When working in tandem your rankings are bumped to a low A rank. There was some debate on that last I heard. She admitted. Some of the more conservative members of the ranking panels thought it was just the fact that you're Orochimaru san students that are giving you that rank, and thus the increased bounty. Naruto snickered as he sat back down. Looks like they want to be cheap when it comes to you guys. He blinked, a thought coming to him. Oh, hey am I in the books too? Her smile was a little sheepish as she turned to him. Sorry Naruto-kun. Not yet. I was actually surprised by that really considering your performance in the Chunin exams in Iwa. I was certain you'd at least have a C rank by now. It was stupid to feel disappointed by not having a price on your head, but damn it he was. It was like his old life all over again where everyone was a Chonin or a Jounin after he got back and he was still a bloody Genin despite him being able to kick all their asses up and down the road. Now everyone in this life was up and getting bounties ahead of him. He just couldn't win. So Hakusan, what have you been up to since the Chonin exams in Iwa? Kyofu asked. Oh, would you like some breakfast? She asked as she remembered her manners. Just some juice is okay. I ate before I came here actually. She admitted. Kyofu got up to get an extra glass. So. Naruto ventured. How's that Kimi what's his name? Seriously why could he never remember that guy's name? Kimi Maro? She smiled, though there was a little sadness lingering there. He's, doing well so to speak. Became a jounin earlier than the rest of our class. He's teaching some students now actually. That made Ryoko raise an eyebrow. Really? He's like what? 18 now? She nodded. Isn't that a little young? It is but he's a little sick. It's okay now but it could get bad in a moment's notice. I suppose he wants to leave some of his skills behind just in case. That. Ryoko began, frowning. Kinda sucks. Haku shrugged. It's known throughout the village. And I decided to tell you in case we see him. I'd rather not have him need to explain about it. Sorry. I know it's not good table conversation. It's understandable. Yuugao cut in smoothly. I will admit though I've never really faced or fought alongside a Yuki Nin, nor have I known any who have. Just what can you do? Haku shrugged, the smile losing its sadness as the subject shifted. Oh I'm afraid I'm not that good a representation on my clan's skills to be honest. I've mostly dedicated myself to medicinal arts and medical ninjutsu since becoming a Chonin. What really? but you used to kick so much ass what made you switch? Hey! Haku still kicks ass. Tsunade Bakken is a med nin too and just look at her. She beats up the snake whenever they get into a fight. Ryoko opened her mouth and Naruto quickly steamrolled over her words. And no I'm not just saying that because you think she's my girlfriend. Ryoko's mouth closed with a click and obviously fake pout coming across her lips. Mo! And here I thought I'd get you again. Oh well! Looks like I'll have to put a bit more effort into it next time. Naruto glowered. Don't you have somewhere to be? He's right. Yuugao snorted out a quick laugh. Finish your breakfast or we'll be running late. Zero. Dan was not like his wife in many respects. He loved the woman dearly but would admit that he wasn't a fan of her methods of handling a crisis. Namely, punch the source of the nearest crisis until it stopped being a problem. Or shout. Or both. Sometimes, a lot of the times, with blackmail and vandalism thrown in somewhere. He liked to think he was a bit more calm, a bit more rational and level-headed when it came to managing crisis. Evidently the academy teachers agreed with that assessment since they went through the trouble of actually going through Anbu channels to reach him rather than making a phone call to the hospital. They might be re-evaluating their assessment though as he all but bowled over their staff as he all but tore his way down the hallways to reach Akane's homeroom class. The door's handle is almost embedded into the drywall. Otosan. It barely takes a second for him to look her over and he releases the slightest breath of relief. She's okay. Not a hair hurt on her head and she's running down the steps of the classroom's tears to reach him all but jumping into his waist to give her best hug. He looks up, towards a corner of the classroom where three chairs are little more than charred shingles of wood and half-melted slag. Kato-san. He hears the woman beside him and turns to look in her direction as he reaches down and picks up his little girl, her legs wrapped around his ribs and her hands fisting at the hair on the back of his head as her head goes into his shoulder, away from the woman. What happened? He asks. The messenger hadn't gotten much farther than Sir. And Akane before he was out the door like a madman. 
maybe he didn't handle crisis as well as he thought. AKA Chan got into a verbal altercation with another student. I wasn't able to hear what started the whole thing unfortunately. Eventually she shouted at him. Telling him too, and I quote just shut up. And the result is. She gestured. Thus. No hand seals? None that I saw. It wasn't a focused attack sir. From the quickness of the er, explosion and her near panic after it occurred leads me to believe this was purely accidental. She's always been one of our model students as well. She confessed. And the boy? Third degree burns on his hand. He'll be missing an eyebrow as well. We sent him to the hospital quickly. The rest of the students in the vicinity will feel as though they suffered a mild sunburn but they'll survive. I, I understand. Can I take her home and discuss this with your staff tomorrow? Or the next day with Tsunade this is. Do not worry Kato-san. This eventuality was foreseen when Akane was admitted by both ourselves and you of course. Take as long as you need to get back to us, we'll be submitting a report to the Hokage on the events in question by the end of the workday mind you so you don't have to worry about doing such yourselves. Again, he nodded. Thank you. He doesn't wait for much longer. He's so curt that it borders on rude as he marches out of the building, his daughter clinging to him. He walks straight home, carrying her the whole way. It's hard opening the door with her in his arms but he manages. He moves to set her down on the couch but she clings to him. I'll be right back honey. Just gonna get you something from the kitchen okay? She doesn't let go for a second but then she nods and slides off to rest at the couch. He makes his way to the kitchen, and quickly goes for his secret weapon when dealing with woes of any of the three ladies in his life. Ice cream. It's noticeably more difficult to remain angry or sad when having ice cream. The same can be said of eating. But ice cream was eating something sweet. Doubly effective. Women have been doing it to themselves to get over big emotional moments for ages. So he goes into the kitchen, gets the biggest small cup he can find and puts two scoops of vanilla in there before marching out. He sits down next to her, wonders if maybe he should get one himself before dismissing the idea and handing it to her. Here you go baby. She takes the cup, doesn't start to eat immediately. A real bad one then. You wanna tell me what happened baby girl? She shook her head. Why not? He asks gently, passing a hand over her hair. I'm your dad. You can tell me anything you know. She stays quiet for a while. When she mumbles something he doesn't quite catch it. What was that baby? Am I adopted? He fells like he's just been smacked. If he'd been hit in the chest with a sledgehammer by Mito guy it probably would have hurt less. He was so glad his wife wasn't here. He wasn't sure if she'd rage or cry. Probably both. What? She shrinks further into herself. Gao said I have to be adopted. He said that you can't be my daddy or mommy can't be mommy since you don't have red hair like mine. And that my eyes are different in that. He's currently debating whether or not he should give Tsunade the boy's home address when he speaks. Actually needing to work to undo the clenching of his jaw enough to speak. And requiring genuine effort to calm himself down enough to speak in his usual soft tones. Honey. Look at me. She shook her head. That hurt. Please. She finally complies. Her eyes are brimming with tears. You're our daughter. Don't let Gao or any other idiot tell you any differently. You were. He paused. Considering his words. Born with your mother's hair. But we gave you red hair. Why? I like mommy's hair. She protested, not knowing just how many people found her red locks absurdly beautiful due to their rarity. He had to work to fish for an explanation. I'll tell you when you're 10. Okay? By then she could either handle it better, or she'd forget. Simple. Her nose scrunched up. That's so far away. Your ice cream's melting. She took a bite. The next one she took on her own. Better. He smiled. Honey. Listen to me. I can't tell you right now why you have red hair. Me and mommy would get in trouble. But I can tell you when you're 10. You just remind me then and I'll tell you, I promise. Okay? She took another bite of her treat. She didn't look happy. But she nodded. Okay. You just need to know that me and mommy gave you your red hair. Like we give you toys. Okay? Okay. She didn't seem to like it, but at least she accepted it. We do have to talk about the fire aka, he said, tilting his head a little to keep sight of her as she ducked her head again burying her chin into her chest. 
I was mad, she said by way of answer. Did you want to hurt Gao because of what he said? A little, she mumbled into her shirt. But but I didn't want to burn him. She added hastily, her eyes wide and coming up to him as though pleading with him to believe her. I just wanted him to shut up and stop saying those mean things about me and my hair. I know honey I know. He did. He always knew that she'd never hurt someone, but that one fine day her raw power as a jinchuriki might inadvertently hurt someone. Today was the first day he came close to regretting the choice he and Tsunade came to in allowing her to become a jinchuriki. Oh that fight had been terrible. The worst one they'd had bar none. Eight months pregnant. He would remember that as the absolute worst time of their lives together. She had been so furious with him for even suggesting it. They argued for almost a straight week, every night had been a shouting match. She'd been flat out unwilling to even listen to the notion and her vehemence had almost made him back down several times. It wasn't like he disagreed with her. Being a Jinchuriki was dangerous. It was a target painted on your back from the word go. It meant the whole world would be gunning for you one way or another. One needed to look no further than Naruto. Donzo had been circling the boy like a shark circles a bloody carcass since the day he was born. Iwa had all but put a hit on him just from finding a resemblance to Minato. If they had ever even come close to suspecting he was a Jinchuriki on top of that Aniki would have spared no expense on making sure he was dead. He would have informed Kumo, Kiri, Suna. Even the lesser villages. The only relatively safe Jinchuriki were those that managed to reach the age of 20. By that point they were strong enough on their own to take down virtually anyone. Only the most elite ninja would have a chance to survive, let alone win. Hell, Kumo's Hachibi was said to be all but invincible against everyone in that village. The same dangers that applied to Naruto applied just as much to their little girl. Maybe more since he and Tsunade were still alive and she could be used as leverage against them. But the niggling, stupid question always lingered at the back of his mind. If not us, then who? What other family could help a child with ninja skills better than one comprised of two S-class shinobi as parents? Who could protect from both internal and external threats better? If they didn't volunteer then whose child would be taken? And the child would be taken. Sarutobi would only use it as a last resort but it'd be a resort he'd have to fall on. No one in Konoha, with their memory still so vivid of the monstrosity that was the QB would willingly give their child to such danger. Much less when the child had to be so very young. He'd take a child from a family, or an orphan. Who would help him then? Naruto had him, had Tsunade, had Shizun, Sarutobi and even Orochimaru for all the loathing he showed the man. But that was only because the boy was Minato and Kushina's child. That was a reality. If Naruto had been a genuine no-name orphan plucked off the side of the road, the level of love that they all held for him wouldn't be nearly as great as it was. And they still weren't there for him as much as they should be. He lived alone. He cooked his own meals, did his own laundry, trained and learned by himself. They weren't his parents as much as they did love him they couldn't support him as much as Minato and Kushina would have had they been alive. They could never measure up to that. How much worse would it be for a boy or a girl that wouldn't even have that? So he pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed. Tsunade had finally left one night. Two days later he had Orochimaru busting down his door and trying to murder him in his office. And no, that wasn't a euphemism, nor was he exaggerating. He suspected the only reason he was still alive was because someone had called in Hatake who did need to actually fight the serpent off. He reckoned the man was the only one in the village that would have been able to. It had been the first time he'd heard of his wife crying since Jiraiya's death. He hadn't pressed charges. A month later Orochimaru had been assigned to a long-term mission. Just enough time to see and pick up little Akane with her head of hair. Not red at that time. The snake had smiled. Left her a little toy kunai she'd gnawed almost to bits when she was teething. Then the Anbu came and he was gone for a while. A long while. They had a, long talk after that. Very long. He'd cried those nights. And almost all the nights in between until the ritual was finally done. When she saw her head of fire red hair the next morning, Tsunade had cried and held Akane all night all but refusing to let her go. Did the fire have something to do with my hair? She asked, her hands going up to her scalp, fingers tangling themselves in a gorgeous mass. Can you take that part away? You can leave the hair if you want daddy but I don't want to burn someone again. He felt like he was just gored through the chest with a spear. He leaned down, kissing the top of her head. I know baby girl I know. Chapter 25 
He had to admit. Without the storms and the constant, dreary rain, Kiri was quite beautiful. It was a different beauty from that of Konoha. Every house was made of a dark, almost black with that contrasted sharply with the white sands and white limestone roads. The baby blue overhangs that shaded the city as they hung from the roofs of houses allowed the light that filtered through them to be far less harsh and cast the light in a pale blue shade that made the limestone roads glimmer like water. It was a tactic he knew. Cover this place in mist and those drapes would make it even harder to see down here. But it was nice that it could pass off as something aesthetically pleasing in peacetime really. They were currently in the marketplace. With Kyofu and Haku looking through the shops. His teammate had perused over and eventually bought some Kiri forged kunai and shuriken sets. They were sharp as all hell, perfectly balanced and able to channel chakra. In Konoha the craftsmanship would have cost nearly double the standard issue pieces. Here in Kiri, where the legendary blades of the seven swordsmen had been forged, those kunai were standard issue. Now, as Haku eyed a length of ice blue silk, the shoe was more or less on the other foot. You're not considering buying it right? He heard Kyofu hiss. He's charging a fortune. Haku blushed but clutched at the fabric with a very determined grip. But, look at it. Yeah it's real pretty. Kyofu conceded. But this is a price you'd charge for an Abarame spun silk. This she rubbed her thumb over the piece in question. Is hardly Abarame spun silk. The lining isn't reinforced to resist blades and tearing. You can't do that without making it feel too thick though. Clearly you have never purchased from Abarame, Kyofu said very tossing her nose in the air. Haku looked like she was about ready to buy it anyway. He had to admit. It was a very pretty length of silk. It just wasn't made by Shino's aunt and uncle. Well it's only fair, he said, beaming that megawatt smile only his 12-year-old self could pull off with its full 100% effectiveness. Haku showed you where to get good kunai, so when she comes to Konoha, we'll show her where to get good silk. I won't be going to Konoha for a while Naruto-kun. Haku smiled back. Tell you what. Kyofu grinned. Give us a good tour and when we get back I'll buy you some silk in this shade and send it your way. Oh no I couldn't ask for. You didn't ask, I offered. Hey. Why don't you ever buy me anything? Naruto squawked. Kyofu chuckled. Because all you want is ramen. It's cheaper than silk. He groused. It's also unhealthy, with more salt than broth and more broth than vegetables. Someone's gotta look out for your health, she said. Didn't you spend time abroad Naruto-kun? Didn't you find any food you liked more than ramen? He shrugged. Not any food that I liked more than Ichiraku ramen. There's a difference. All the run-of-the-mill ramen stands out there, yeah I tasted food better than those guys. But Ichiraku's got the best food period. Haku offered a light laugh. Well if I ever do go to Konoha, you'll have to take me. He smiled. It's a date. He realized the mistake of his wording when Kyofu hugged him with something between an awe and a squeal escaping her. You're so cute, trying to get the girls. Naruto grinned. Who said anything about trying? She let him go, hands rising into the air. Well excuse me. The amused smirk on Haku's face, coupled with an eyebrow that arched like a perfect bow up to her forehead said it all. Hmm. As one, the three turned to the voice, finding none other than Momochi Zabuza raising a hairless eyebrow in their direction, arms crossed. Zabuza-sensei. Haku smiled. What are you doing here? Stalking you. Naruto snickered before Kyofu kicked his calf in reprisal, glaring at him with a look that said behave. H.N. The Jounin groused. They're not your friends Haku. They're your job. And with his peace said the silent killing master brushed past them continuing off to wherever he'd been going towards beforehand, leaving the three of them in an uncomfortable silence. Haku was red-faced with either mortifying embarrassment or anger. It was hard to tell. Naruto shrugged. May, fuck that guy. I say we're friends. Aren't we Haku? It was simple, straight and to the point. It made her smile even as she was no doubt disagreeing with the first part of his statement, a little bit. She nodded though. He'd take it and call it a win. Don't worry about it Hakusan. Kyofu put in. Yeah, sure we suspected that you were sent to keep an eye on us but it was still nice for you to show us around like this rather than keep us locked in the house. I, I wouldn't do that. She straightened. Right let's just, not mention this again. How about I show you one of Kiri's attractions? That'd be nice. Kyofu admitted. 
by requirement of the 12 year old. It must have explosions. XXXXX. The place Haku had taken them to was downright gorgeous. The glittering caves were a somewhat natural formation. It had been made by the attacks of the Sanbi meeting the unyielding defenses of those long since deceased, in a conflict that had taken place before the founding of the village even. The glitter was the salt that had dried up and seeped into the rock of the cave after centuries. Long after the sea water the monster had used in his attacks had evaporated. The caves extended for miles. And it was only during the high noon sun that the rays of light bounced with enough force that they could see the glimmer of the salt in the rock. Water still gathered at its smooth basins. A single drop sending crystal clear ripples through shimmering pools. Frankly, the only thing he could remember about this place was that another 200 yards and there was a cavity. One big enough to house the ceiling matrix that had launched him back here to begin with. Things were so very different in a world without, all of that. Wow, I'm surprised no one's ever heard of this place. Haku shrugged in response to Ryofu's observation. It's too close to the village to allow for any kind of tourism. So there's no point in openly announcing it. But for those who have access to Kiri, it's definitely something they should be brought to see at least once. He agreed. With the light of the sun peeking in through the cracks in the stone above. The rocks, spikes and cave walls gleamed like an ocean of shimmering rainbows. If only the others could have seen it like this. He hadn't realized he'd spoken aloud until Haku and Kyofu turned to him. What was that Naruto? He stiffened before laughing. Oh nothing. I was just talking about you Agao and Ryoko. Wish they could be here to see it with us. I'm sure they'll have their chance Naruto. Kyofu smirked, ruffling his hair. He smiled, though he looked away in case it didn't quite reach his eyes. Suddenly, a loud shout echoed through the cavern. That is such bullshit. Naruto tilted his head. Uh, what was that? Kyofu asked, turning towards Haku. Some sensei used these caves as a soft training ground. It was probably one of the students. She smiled sheepishly. Seems no matter where I take you to it turns out a little strange. Soft training ground? A place where they won't throw around any destructive techniques. Just chakra control and perhaps some hand-to-hand combat to teach them to fight on odd types of terrain. Oh I see. Well we probably shouldn't bother that the obvious end to her sentence was cut short as she turned to where Naruto should have been only to see the diminutive Chonin all but slithering his way through the maze of stonework towards where he heard the voice. Naruto. My young curious mind must be sated in its desire for knowledge, he cried with a no doubt stupid grin on his face. You're just a nosy brat. She called back. Don't encourage this, she said to the giggling Haku. A minute later Naruto was climbing over the last of the stones, crouching as he looked down and spied three kids with their sensei. Their very pale sensei with waist-length silver hair and two dots on his forehead. Oh. Hi Kimi something something or other, he shouted and waved, completely giving away his position as the three kids turned on the sound of his voice. Kimi Maro for his part, opened his eyes which Naruto, somewhat worriedly noted to be more than a little exhausted, dark bags hanging under them. Huh? Hey sensei you know this leaf guy. Oh we go way back. Ask him about the time he tried to kill me Lee and Gara. Like, oh 12, 13 years ago. He snickered. In a way. He answered, shifting where he sat. Naruto had the faint suspicion that the man had been moving to stand before he decided against it, determining it to be more trouble than it was worth. We fought together during our first respective Chonin examinations in Iwa. Naruto stuck his tongue out. He's the boring one. One of the kids, the girl glared at him. Someone's got a crush. He smiled, the twelve-year-old in him wanted to tease so very badly. What are you doing here Uzumaki? It was at that point Haku and Kyofu walked up behind him. He grinned. Hey guys look who I found. The man blinked. I see. So these are the delegates you were told to escort Haku-san? Yes. She smiled. I was going to tell you later today. I knew you'd remember Kyofu-san, Naruto-san and Ryoko-san. A Janan team from Konoha and an Iwa examination is hardly something one would forget, he said before turning to his students. If I recall correctly, I gave you three an exercise. Yeah. A bullshit exercise. One boy with dark hair growled out. It can't be that bad Matu-kun, Haku said as she stepped down the rocks with a grace that defied the odd terrain. What exactly did he give you all to do? Soul exercise. He answered tapping his foot. 
Haku winced. Already? They're only Janan. The boy, Matu whirled on his sensei, glaring as if saying "See, si Haku agrees with me. We learned it when we were Janan. Our sensei were trying to fail us. She deadpanned. You're trying to fail us? Matu screeched, looking downright murderous. He's not trying to fail us you idiot. We've been his Janan for three months. There's no exam to fail. The girl said. She was a thin thing. Shorter than Sakura or Ino at this age. With short cut hair that reminded Naruto of Kurotsuchi before she let it grow out save the single, thin tail that trailed down to between her shoulder blades. Oh. Still giving us a bullshit exercise. He groused. I'm sure it's not so bad. The last boy said. He was an average build with a head of straight brown hair that he was either trying to grow out or that needed a bit of a haircut. He wants us to stand for a straight hour on that Matu pointed at a stalactite with a very very sharp tip to his right. Using nothing but the bare soles of our feet. I am sorry sir but that is bullshit. Naruto tilted his head. Chakra control. Figures. Most Janan sucked at it. He did have to say it was a little intense though. Focusing all the chakra to a point on the sole of their foot to release a steady stream of energy to hold their whole body weight off of the spike was harder than tree walking and even water walking to a degree. Mainly because you had the whole foot to work with. A mistake in one area might be compensated for with the other tenketsu. Here, you just had one spot to work with and a single slip-up could throw you completely off. Judging by the scrapes from near misses on the kids' feet they were evidently learning this fact rather quickly. That's rough, Naruto said, then grinned. Hey you know what I did to get my sensei to teach me stuff I wanted to learn? I made bets with him. It was the truth. Getting Jiraiya to sit down and do anything productive that didn't involve him working on his books was damn near impossible. So Naruto often made bets and challenges with his teacher to get him to teach him something new. Of course, what he didn't tell these kids is that he lost those bets and challenges half the time. Partially because Jiraiya was just that good at being able to judge how things would play out. And partially because he cheated when he may have been wrong. Was it any wonder he was never taught anything outside of harnessing Kurama's chakra in that trip? Oh well. They'd learn. A bet? Yeah. Naruto nodded. You know. A bet. Sensei if I can do X you'll teach me Y and if I can't I'll run around the village five times with my hands, or something. The Matu boy looked interested. So did Kimimaro. Though, he suspected he was more interested in the running around the village five times on my hands part. We're all crazy strong sensei just plain old crazy to boot? Could there ever be one strong guy that wasn't a total head case? Matu turned. Hey sense. No. And just like that the wind was ripped out of those sails real quick. I'll tell you what we'll do instead. He drawled and the children perked up again. Rather than you three coming up with simple bets that would be in your favor. I will issue you a challenge. Complete it to my satisfaction and I will teach you whatever you wish. If you don't then you do my exercise as I have asked it. Deal, Matu shouted for his teammates. Not giving any credence or thought to the fact that the challenge might be even tougher than the exercise itself. Very well. I will give each of you a B rank ninjutsu to study and learn if you manage to land a single hit on Uzumaki. Naruto blinked. Huh? Hey. When did I get dragged into this? When you decided to interrupt my lesson and give my students foolish ideas. The sickly Jounin answered. Besides that I am interested to see if you have improved and I am not currently feeling up to fighting you myself. My students could use a lesson in dealing with foreign techniques as well. You've provided a rare avenue of teaching few get safe access to. Then, the bone wielder leaned his head back against the stone he was resting on and closed his eyes. Naruto squinted. Hey you didn't just die on us did you? Don't make fun of Kimimaro-sensei. The girl glared at him. What? It's a legitimate question? The boy snapped back. You're an insensitive jerk. And you're short. You're shorter than me. Naruto's chagrin was obvious at the fact that he'd momentarily forgotten that he, indeed was. Are you even a chonin? Matu cut in. Naruto glared at all three. Even the brown-haired kid that was actually smiling somewhat apologetically behind his two teammates. You know. I was actually considering letting you kids hit me so you'd get your B-rank technique but, know what? Screw it. I'm gonna make you sit on that spike by the time we're done. A little to the left of him, standing beside Haku, Kyofu had a hand to her forehead. Fantastic impression, 
one of Konoha's chonin getting into a shouting match with three genin. Haku laughed. He is their age, she said by way of explanation. It's only natural he's a bit competitive. Ryofu looked at her out of the corner of her eyes. You're not that much older to be talking like that. Haku shrugged. Naruto jumped down from his perch and he watched all three Jinan tense, getting into well-worn and practiced fighting stances. Each unique. Evidently Kimimaro had been refining some of their close-range skill. He almost let a smirk slip past his mock-angry expression. He'd never had students to torture. This would be a learning experience for everyone. Yay! It's the simple joys of life really. XXXXX. Itachi had never known blindness. So that, of course, was their first target. The drug had taken her sight first. It was the most obvious of the senses the one people relied on the most to perceive the world. She supposed they suspected she was even more vulnerable to such. Some genetic predisposition even without the manifestation of the Sharingan eye that they could exploit to a greater effectiveness. The next thing they took was her hearing. Then, her sense of smell and her sense of touch. All they left was her sense of taste. Just so she could suffer further as the vile concoction of whatever liquid they force-fed her made her constantly want to throw up even as the thing impeded her ability to do so, weakening the stomach muscles that would force it back upwards. A targeted chemical. Was this Tsunade's design? Or Orochimaru's? Or even another chemist altogether? Her insides burned and roiled, her tongue felt like ash in her mouth and all that seemed to pierce the fugue of her drug-induced state was the pain that she became more and more aware of as her sense of touch slowly returned. It was only then that she realized just how numb she'd been. How she couldn't feel anything, not even the pressure of where she lay. She thought she'd been sitting. She had been when they gave her the drug. Did she fall or did they move her? Even her sense of balance had been thrown askew. If they could move her without her noticing, if she could fall without feeling a thing, be shifted from position without even the vaguest sense of motion, what else had they done? Who knows if they injected her with anything else while she couldn't feel. Where they had touched her or what they had done while she lay here, all but unconscious with her hands bound. A creeping terror, a horror slithered its way through her mind before, like iron rods clamping down over a lock her mind became a fortress. Pure training and discipline overriding base emotion as she forced that part of her mind back into a place where they could not use it against her. She focused on counting. Sensory deprivation did strange things to the ebb and flow of time. It was one of the reasons it was so effective. Humans were social creatures, needing interaction, people, conflict and stimulation of any sort on a constant basis. Someone trapped without the use of the senses for an hour could feel as though he'd spent five or more in the silent dark making someone feel as though they were trapped here for days even when it had only been mere hours, exacerbating every pain, every agony because they felt as though they would never ever get out. But keep count, and rationality would once more endure over the base emotion of fear. It would let you know you were here only for a few minutes, not a few hours, would allow one to extrapolate patterns, possibly deduce how often they had to dose her. Determine how long before starvation, dehydration and other effects set in. Keep the mind busy. Keep the fear at bay. Because fear above all things is the mind killer. 2286 seconds. Translated to minutes it was 38 minutes and 6 seconds. That's how long it took before she could hear again. Her senses just starting to return before someone spoke. Their voice muddled and distant, as though speaking through a wall. What is the passphrase? She smirked. 2286. She heard him pull away. Heard his voice again. Lie to me again and we'll leave you here all night. Her smirk didn't vanish. It might have felt that way otherwise. But she doubted they'd leave her more than an hour or two. The drug would wear off in that time after all. 2291, she continued. Dose her again. She heard. She didn't feel the needle against her flesh, that sense had not fully returned yet. But it didn't matter. She kept counting. XXXXX. It was the brown haired kid, surprisingly, that was the last to throw in the towel. He collapsed on the ground, panting and wheezing. Naruto stood above them with a triumphant smirk. Then, as the boy was catching his breath, he saw the blonde vanish and the caves around him grow, dimmer. He brought his head up to look around. And there was his sensei sitting on a wooden stool, half-eaten bento boxes just to the side glaring at a shogi board. The leaf girl sitting across from him, equally pensive. To his left were Haku and Naruto, with Haku leaning over a page the Konoha Chonin was scrawling on, 
asking a question or two as the boy answered, still writing. The Kiri Janan lifted his hands, his two teammates taking notice of the surreal change. Kai. They did the same. The three of you should have done that a long time ago. Their sensei flatly intoned, slowly lifting a piece off the shogi board and making his move. You've been trapped in the genjutsu since the very start of the proposed fight. Yeah, Naruto laughed. And my genjutsu sucks. Least I know I'm good enough to trick Shinon with it. Picked up a few things from Enchan don't you know? W wait Matu cried. That was all a genjutsu? What? What the hell have you all been doing this whole time? The girl screeched. Well Naruto raised his eyes to the ceiling, recalling the events we watched you three run around like a bunch of idiots chasing my illusion. Then that kinda got boring. Once you've seen one group of idiots shouting at a spot on the wall, you've kinda seen M all Somi and Haku went to go get lunch. Kyofu Chan and Kimi decided to keep watch over you and play shogi. We got back played lunch and I decided to start making a seal to show you a gal her book was written by a complete few who he blinked. Hey, wait, where'd you guys get the shogi board? Needless to say, you've failed the challenge, Kimimaro said, eyes never leaving the aforementioned piece of furniture. Naruto's energy and focus were more directed towards his sealing practice and explanations than you and he still managed to hold you in his thrall. We're sorry sensei. The girl moped, downcast. Don't be, he said. Clearly the failure is mine. I have not taught you well enough. Geez you don't have Tom make it sound like you're at a funeral. Naruto cut in. Oh we'll do better next time or hey wait a minute. How about you actually admit I'm way out of a Janan's league rather than try and paint it like they had anything but hopes and dreams here. Evidently however, Kimimaro was too engrossed in his game, or maybe his sickness affected his hearing because in the next second the man turned, blinking at Naruto. I'm sorry did you say something? The blonde sucked in a sharp breath, a retort on his lips before some part of him may as well have punched him across the face and shook his conscious mind for all it was worth. You are not going to take the role of Mito guy here. Kimimaro had to wonder what it was that he'd said as Naruto, quite literally cracked his neck in the other direction and forced himself to look back at the seal he was working on. XXXXX. Koto's hand stroked his steed's forehead, the small flat plane between the animal's eyes. He heard it neigh in appreciation, one foot stomping down into the ground. Ah. Got you something you'd enjoy. From his robes, the daimyo pulled free an apple. Not exactly the healthiest option for any horse but a little indulgence never hurt anyone. The animal bit into the red fruit and with two bites it was all but gone. He reached for the brush. The stable hands always had something of an aneurysm when he lowered himself to such menial tasks but he was the daimyo. And if the daimyo wants to help with the upkeep of his own horse everyone would just have to deal with it. The hand brush was worn, and he could feel that familiar sliver digging into his thumb. He'd have to sand that down soon before he got a piece of wood in his. He looked to the stable door as someone stood there. Shouldn't someone else be doing that, Hiruzen said slowly, puffing on his pipe. It helps me think. He answered with a soft smile, brushing the animal's back. You took up painting. I like tending to my animals. Hmm. The Hokage pulled up a stool. I suppose we all need our hobbies. Several, Koto laughed. I can't make do with just one. I don't believe I've ever shown you my tea kettles. When you come visit next time I'll show you. And you'll show me one of your paintings which you hide like a village secret. Just sparing you from the ugly sight. He smirked, before it fell, pulling the pipe out from between his teeth with a sigh. Koto-sama. I will push for peace. The man said, reaching down for the horse's hoof to clean out the grit, dirt and rocks that had dug themselves into its hoof. I understand why you did not grant my request and I will not try to go over your head. But I will still make an attempt at peace. I hope you understand Sarutobi. The older man breathed. I do. I don't believe you'll succeed. But should you prove us all wrong again, I will do all I feasibly can to support it. The daimyo smiled though he doubted it was meant in any way to be malicious, an old idiom came to mind. It is the fools who make feasts and it is the wise men that eat them. Chapter 26 The horn sounded out like an alarm in the middle of the night, waking absolutely everyone in the palace. Kurotsuchi sat up in her bed, trying to make heads or tails of what was going on before her brain caught up with the situation. She got up, immediately hearing the scuff of footsteps, the whisper of voices. The palace crier somehow made his shout carry through the whole building. She honestly had to wonder if that was some kind of jutsu. 
it wasn't human to be able to be loud enough to have everyone in a 500-yard structure hear you clear as day. She stood up, hastily throwing on a shirt and some pants to march out of her room. The hubbub of servants and personnel making their way to the courtyard would have told her exactly who was coming even if the crier somehow hadn't managed it. She stepped out into the cold of the night air with most everyone else. Takeshio, Koto's son took a few minutes longer to at least appear with his hair in proper order, even if his clothing wasn't. The only person who seemed to have the time to get dressed was Kotaro, and she imagined that was because he had no hair to speak of. She looked out into the expanse as the people moved to and fro, hastily lighting up the braziers and torch posts to give some semblance of propriety. She walked up behind Takeshio, three steps to the left and two behind him. She wasn't much for the propriety of the court but simple things went a long way in giving her leeway for ignoring the ones that really annoyed her. A few minutes later, the thunder of hoofbeats were pounding across the gravel-strewn ground, a column of men making their way closer. They cut through the night in a sheen of metal armor and spear tips, the red of Koto's cloak at the lead of them, the daimyo's distinctive wood armor seeming nearly black in the night. Strange. He wasn't supposed to be back for another week. The daimyo of Hai no Kuni reached the foot of the steps and pulled back on the reins with a chuckle. The massive beast he called a horse reared back just a bit. It jumped once, twice and looked like it would go fully on its hind legs before it stomped down on the ground, settling. Did we wake you? The older man laughed. Not at all Father Takeshio answers with a bow as Koto dismounts the mountain of a horse he favors. We were not expecting you back for another week though. Has something happened? Yes. The man answered, removing his traveling gloves as he climbed the steps. He smiled at his son, then looked past him, straight at her. What happened was that I realized that if I were to return in a week a child would leave my house and I would not get to say a proper goodbye. She offered a sardonic smirk of her own. You did not seriously come back here just to see me off. And why not? He laughed before looking to her left. Nephew. He greeted the smile still staying there. Kotaro bowed, down to the waist. Uncle. I'm gonna take a guess she ventured. And say that you just told us you were coming a week from now so you could get back here and look good. He let out a full-bodied laugh, marching up the stairs and past his son. His hand reached up to run through her hair and settle on her shoulder, leaning down just a bit. You're getting wise to my old tricks eh? She smirked and shrugged. May, she said in faux dismissal. You're not so hard to figure out. He offered another laugh. XXXXX. Haku knocked that morning, like she usually did, hearing Ryoko's voice call out from inside, telling her it was okay to enter which was, not uncommon. Though usually Kyofu or Naruto would move to open the door and greet her personally. Either way, personal greeting or not, nothing seemed overly odd in the house. She opened the door, stepped inside, closed the door behind her and walked inward. That's when things started to get a little odd. Normally at this hour Yuugao, Naruto, Ryoko and Kyofu were at the table having breakfast, ready to start their day, whatever it would entail. Today though only two of the aforementioned four were sitting at the table, Ryoko and Kyofu. The other two were in the living room, a slew of papers thrown around between them with Naruto smiling that smug little grin of his like he was privy to some secret. Yuugao on the other hand was glaring at ink-stained pages, her upper lip curled in irritation. Her clothes were wrinkled, hair frazzled. She looked a bit of a mess which was definitely not like her. Haku blinked, making her way over to the table, the sound of her footsteps the only break in the sepulchral silence. Uh what's going on? She whispered as she approached, almost frightened of breaking some unwritten rule. Ryoko answered her with a grin. Our little Naru is kicking you chan's a. It's so important for your continued ability to breathe that you not finish that sentence. Yuugao's voice cut like a knife, though Ryoko still grinned as she speared some food on her fork and took a bite. Yuugao finally found the time to construct her version of the seal. Naruto-kun boasted that his seal would either flat out work better, or be more chakra efficient. He decided to give her extra tries since he knows one mistake can screw up the whole sealing matrix and she is just starting with the art. Oh I see. She nodded as she sat down, observing the mess of papers. How many tries did he grant? Indefinite, Ryoko chortled with food in her mouth. Little shit said you can try till next year. You won't beat me with that design. She's been at it since last night. The silver-haired Cho Nin got her snickers under control as she looked up to feel that searing gaze of hate directed at the top of her head. Haku tried to be courteous and not smile, she failed, just a bit. 
Still just the thought that this Anbu was getting up shown by a boy less than half her age in any field was indeed a little funny. But she knew it had to sting, a lot. Anbu, any Anbu, fought very hard to get to their position and took pride in doing so. To not only get beat, but apparently get beat so completely by, not only a Chonin, but a Chonin that was 12 years old, would have been a hard slap of humility for anyone. All things considered she was taking it remarkably well if all she did was glare. If Zabuza sensei were to ever take this bet and lose like this. She burst into chuckles and half snorts of laughter she was trying to suppress at the sudden mental image. The teasing he'd endure from Kisame sensei alone would ensure he'd do his best to leave no witnesses. She eeped and tried to cover her mouth to little avail as Yugao's fierce gaze rounded on her. Naruto was still grinning like an idiot. Finally, the purple-haired woman turned to him, who seemed utterly oblivious to the drop-dead order in her eyes. She snorted. All right fine. But this just means I might not be doing this right. Not necessarily that you're an expert. Naruto nodded. So, you'd prefer to label yourself as the one that makes stupid mistakes rather than the author of your crap book? Cease. Speaking her eyes said. Naruto laughed. So Naruto-kun wins? Kyofu ventured tentatively. Yeah yeah. Yugao groused picking herself off the ground and making her way to the table where her now cold breakfast was laid out. Naruto took a minute longer to pick up the scattered pages into some semblance of order before doing the same. I'm a little surprised you studied seals Naruto. It's not exactly a combat effective branch of techniques. Naruto shrugged, then got up as he spoke. They can be if you've got some prep time and imagination. He gave a short bark of laughter. I remember reading some so-called theorists saying that SEALs should be the new frontline mainstay. Guess what happened to those guys? Ryoko frowned mid-bite. Wait, first you say they can be good, then you turn around and say they're complete shit? Eh? He tilted his head this way and that way. Kinda. See, here's the thing. SEALs are powerful. A good enough SEAL designer can do shit you'd normally find impossible with simple gen or ninjutsu. The blades of the Seven Swordsmen were all made with seals. Iwagakura's mountain fortresses were carved out and sustained with seals. The Baijuu are contained with seals. Seals can definitely be complete bullshit. But there's a reason Nin and Genjutsu replace them as frontline, mainstream battle tactics. Those being? Haku asked, interested. She wasn't sure if Naruto was an expert but he seemed experienced enough to take some of his words to heart. And who knows, if she ever has to fight a seal master this information might prove invaluable. Versatility for one, he said as he sat down. Seals are rigid things that function by doing X and they will always do X they can never be made to do Y. If you design a seal to do one thing, it will only ever do that one thing. He took a bite of his food. No one can predict what will happen in a fight so you're gonna be left with a big vulnerability in terms of defense if an enemy tries to overwhelm you with different technique. Unlike say, lightning manipulation. You can make a single, one-man kill assassination technique with it, or you can do a massive area attack, or you can use it to design an escape technique, or a diversion, or use it to enhance your weapon, increase your speed and so on and so forth. So unless you're carrying around 10 or 20 seals on you your techniques are limited and once a decent ninja sees you activate X seal and sees what it does, you'll never really catch him unprepared with another attack like it. Then you're saying Yuugao offered as she swallowed her bite that the best way to use seals, if you were to use them at all would be in a supplementary fashion? Sort of. He answered. The other big weakness of seals is that they take too much time to develop and too little effort to destroy. You can draw a seal on a paper, the enemy can easily burn the paper. You carve it on a tree, cut down the damn tree. You put it on a stone, use an earth jutsu to get rid of the stone, or a lightning technique to cut it anyway and ruin the seal. Best place to have seals for combat is drawn on your own body and that is extremely dangerous unless you really know what you're doing and have a whole team of medics on hand. Even then, do it too much and you'll just turn your insides to jelly or rip your chakra network to pieces. Then why learn it at all? Ryoko rolled her eyes, fiddling around with her food. All you've said is how useless they are. They're not. He protested. Like I said all you need is imagination and prep time. The real strength of seals in an open fight is in a battlefield that you choose and have time to make ready. Seals make some of the absolute best traps and battlefield control mechanisms in the whole world. Imagine the enemy stepping into an area and suddenly up is down, left is right, their whole nervous system is firing backwards, or where they're instantly trapped in an illusion. 
or a field that drains their chakra. Konoha and Kiri use seals in their defensive strategies. It could practically win you a battle outright if you activate the seals at the right time. Here's the thing though, the more complex a seal, the more delicate it is, the more things can go wrong. If one cog in the mechanism jams the whole thing breaks down. I never figured you'd have the patience to pick up such a delicate study. Haku repeated, smiling. Forgive me for saying Naruto-kun but you don't seem like the studious type. The faux twelve-year-old scratched the back of his head. Just got a talent for it. They're underused, that makes M dangerous since a lot of people don't know their weaknesses, but those drawbacks and weak points are very real and very exploitable if your enemy is skilled enough. You could study your whole life to learn seals and never be able to just pop them on the fly mid-combat. Again, it's like a well-made trap. Spring it at the right time and it's a game-changer. Too early, or too late or if the trap's discovered and all you'll be left holding is a very nice, decorated piece of paper and an enemy about to kick your ass. Even the Hiraishin, he internally mused. It was one of the most combat-heavy seals ever designed but it too suffered from the same weaknesses most seals did. Destroy the medium and the technique was destroyed. It was why in all of his tenure as the Yondaime, Minato had only used the technique once and gave his kunai only to certain people. If the methodology of the technique got around it wouldn't take very long to find a quick counter to it. Someone like Tenten for instance could probably have no sold the technique by just using her own thrown weapons to intercept the kunai as they were thrown. Or Guy with his absurd speed might just catch it. Hell, anyone that could spam Genjutsu like Itachi would completely wreck the technique by screwing with the Yondaime's depth perception and have him end up throwing the kunai a mile too close or too far to be of any real use and destroying any of the kunai while the technique was in mid-use. That would end, at best, with the user winding up crashing into a tree, at the speed of light. If the kunai got to its target, and stayed there for a while it was a huge advantage. It's a shame there were just so many ways to make sure that never happened. The Yondaime was smart to keep that card close to the chest until he really needed it. And smarter still to leave little to no survivors whenever he did employ it. He said none of this though. Instead he just smiled and that's SEAL Combat Application 101 with Uzumaki Naruto. We have t-shirts and snacks in the gift shop. The group of women let out smiles and little laughs at the joke. Still. Yuugao mused. If you're right about the SEAL's application on prepared battlefields would you like to put that to the test when we return to Konoha? He shrugged. I guess. There were some SEALs he could give up. A lot of them were his own design and he'd need them to still be surprises in the future rather than mass-produced but there were some he could definitely see about giving to the Anbu to make their jobs easier, or better yet, Itachi herself when she took a role as a hunter nin. Yeah, yeah he could do that. Should have thought of that before. Goes to show him for thinking he'd just be able to do this without her help until the last minute. XXXXX. Tsunade sighed, rubbing at her forehead with the oncoming headache, only half paying attention to the file in her hand. Frankly, Mr. Akinawa's infection wasn't even a remote concern in her head right now. Hell. Nothing going on in this whole hospital was a concern right now. Her daughter, her Jinchuriki daughter was beginning to manifest abilities. It had only happened once, nearly two weeks ago now but it was all she could think about. Every day the thoughts rushing through her head kept both her and Dan up at night. Old fears they'd felt like they'd gotten over years ago when the monster was first sealed in their child were creeping back up again like an insidious infection that had been beaten into submission with antibiotics but had just developed a resistance to the drugs and was now crawling through their systems again. Every night when she got home she'd go to her daughter's room and hold her. And every morning before either of them left she'd look her over and hold her close all over again. There were few feelings in this world that could be as infuriating, depressing or frustrating as the sheer helplessness of powerlessness. That's a word one rarely associates with any of the sanin. But it's exactly how she felt. She knew nothing of how or what occurred to a Jinchuriki as they developed. Kushina was the only one she knew of, but she was a Jinchuriki with a very different seal. One that was a hundred times more powerful than anything they could develop right now. She'd never demonstrated any properties of the legendary Kyubi no Kitsune. She wished they had that seal on her daughter. Powerful, controlled. It'd give the idiots up the chain of command the security of having a Jinchuriki and her the peace of mind that the Yin B would never be able to do anything to her daughter no matter how hard it tried. If the QB couldn't do it, the Yin B had nothing but hopes and dreams on that front. But Kushina had taken much of her secrets with her to the grave, and as knowledgeable of seals as Orochimaru was he was no Uzumaki. 
She opened the door to her office and started, surprised. Speak of the devil. She groused tossing the file on her desk and marching around it towards her occupied seat. Get the hell out of my chair. He didn't. What a surprise. How have you been? He smirked. I'll be a lot better when you get out of my damn chair. She crossed her arms. He stared at her, gold, serpentine eyes fixated on hers with that unerring intensity. How is Akane? She is just fine. I'm the one that's having a hard time. She slapped his knee, softly get the hell out of my chair. I was here first. He smirked, not moving. It's my. She stopped, lifted up a leg and flipped the chair over, toppling it onto its back with a crash. Orochimaru vanished in a puff of smoke, appearing in one of her guest chairs in front of her desk. Such impatience. He smirked as she picked up her chair with a chakra string. She sat herself down. Did you actually have something important to talk with me? Or are you here just to annoy me? She turned her eyes down towards her work, keeping one ear in his direction. Would you like to talk? She scoffed. Talk about what? She's a Jinchuriki we always knew this was gonna happen. It's she reached into her drawer, yanking a file free before slamming it down on the desk. You know, about time life came over and slapped me across the face to remind me what I decided to do with my baby girl a few years ago. Gotta do what's best for the village after all. She slammed the drawer closed, hard enough to shake her whole desk. That's what we gotta do right. Always gotta keep that in perspective. That's what's important right? Never mind how that'll screw over some kid. Village has to come first. Her pale teammate said nothing, watching her as she forced herself to keep busy in an effort to not break something. Or him. They always fought but if she let herself get anywhere near him right now she might genuinely hurt him more than the little scraps and scuffles they usually had. She sighed. Look Oro just leave me alone. This isn't really the time. Would you like me to help? She slammed her fists down onto the table, standing up and all but ready to punch him through the wall of the room. Now you listen to me you fucking bastard. My kid isn't ever gonna be used as a chess piece on the political games you play. I will fucking bury yo. Tsunade. He held up his hands, the picture of calm as he tried to placate her. No games, no tricks. You say no. I walk out and we never speak of it again. She grit her teeth, all but baring her fangs at him before she slowed, allowing herself to stop and think. She knew her teammate. Had known him for the better part of thirty years. He was a bastard. A manipulative son of a bitch with a mean streak a mile wide and ten miles deep. He'd twist anyone and anything around his little fingers when he got something in his head. But she knew him. There were very few times that she could say he was completely honest with anyone. This, counted as one of those times. He hadn't given her a sales pitch. He hadn't come with a script in his head for convincing her, or a plan to go over her head if she said no. He didn't say you should let me help or I can help, you know? He simply said. Would you like me to help? He was leaving the choice entirely in her hands. It had been a long time since he'd done that for anyone. Not even when she'd had her huge fight with Dan so many years ago. He'd gone off on his own initiative and it had only been later that she discovered that the two of them had fought at all. Supposedly even Kakashi had gotten involved. She took a deep breath. This is for real? No bullshit no grab for prestige or clout? I say no you walk out that door and that's it? She is my goddaughter if you'll recall. He drawled. She couldn't tell if he was amused or irritated. Answer. She warned, not wanting to leave him a way out. He rolled his eyes. Yes. None. I will. Satisfied? He answered. She let her features soften. Just, I don't know, take a look at the seal, keep your ear to the ground, maybe talk to some of her teachers. You don't have to teach her anything, just. Be there, he said, surprising her. Yeah, she said after a moment. He nodded and stood. And just like that he turned to march out of the room. No jokes no backward taunts or words that could just as easily be taken as a threat. He stood up and walked out. It's weird. She realized she spoke this last thought aloud when he turned, an eyebrow raised. Excuse me? She blinked. It's just, it's been a long time since I've seen you serious. It's, strange. He scoffed. Don't become too fond of it, he said before moving to close the door behind him. Such a state of affairs would leave our sensei immensely bored can't have that. She let out a small laugh under her breath. 
I'll be sure to tell him you said so. She called at the closed door. XXXXX. In his office, the Hokage who was the subject of a private joke between his two students currently puffed on his pipe as he mused over the graduation slip sitting on his desk. HRGN. He grumbled under his breath, smoke wafting out from between the teeth biting down over his pipe. How very irritating. He's had graduation classes be short of students. The odd one out that had to take a replacement from an older Janan on the reserves list. He's had classes where there were not enough sensei to go around. It happens all the time when the village was in a state of war. But never has he had this particular issue. Not enough sensei, and an odd number of Janan graduates. He groused. You do know how to provide headaches don't you Iruka? Sorry sir. But you kinda see the issue now yes? The Chonin teacher asked. Yes I understand Sarutobi said. Admittedly half the problem was of his own making. He'd called in several Jounin to bolster their northern and eastern border patrols. Koto might be pushing for peace but with the mere mention of those negotiations opening, he knew Anaki well enough to know that the old bastard might get, ideas. Hmm. I'll look through the reserves list for an adequate fill-in. It's a shame though. He mused. I'd hoped Kakashi would finally deign to leave Anbu and take a team, would have made this easier. Hasn't he been the lead Anbu over his tenure already? The Chonin asked. He will if he stays for another four months. The Hokage answered. At any rate there are a few Tokubutsu Jown and I can call on that will be more than enough to teach Janan. He got up, marching over towards a filing cabinet to the side of the room. What was the off-number team Iruka? Um, that would be Team 7 Hokage-sama. Haruno Sakura and Sasuke Uchiha are the Janan of that team. Chapter 27 She was nervous. It wasn't like her to be nervous. She couldn't even remember the last time she'd been nervous. No, wait scratch that. She remembered the last time she was nervous. It was when she first came here. The Loni Wagakura princess inside a canopy of leaves. At the time she couldn't wait for the day she'd be allowed to go back home. Now when the day had finally arrived after six years, on her sixteenth birthday, she was nervous all over again, all but willing someone to tell her that her grandfather was delayed, or that he would come by a few days later because of complications. Or that war had been declared on someone somewhere that would make it more difficult for this to happen today. God what she wouldn't give for, just, anything that could help. What could she say to the man? To her father? What would they say to her? Did they even want her back? She was here for six years, taught by Leaf Shinobi. Iwo was just a memory for her. This was her reality, if not her home. Would they really want her back? And if they did would they trust her to be a ninja of Iwagakur? Or did they just want her back so that Koto didn't have her? Would they relegate her down to a tool for a marital alliance? Even with all her training and skill? She hoped that wasn't the case. Hoped her family would care for her as more than just a piece in the political game. But, she wasn't blind to where exactly she stood on that playing field either. She wasn't sure who was more to blame for this at all. Her grandfather for making that stupid bet in the first place, or Koto for choosing her as the price in exchange for her father's life. This was nerve-wracking. She walked through the halls of the palace, all but avoiding everyone else. She didn't really want to hear Takeshio's well-meaning reassurances or even Koto's odd way of talking circles around her in ways that ended up making her feel better. She, masochistically perhaps, wanted to be left alone with her thoughts. It was easier to brace oneself for disappointment if they allowed their expectations for future events to be abysmally low, that way they could only be pleasantly surprised. Unfortunately, in her preoccupation, she didn't really pay attention nearly as much as she should have. As such when she stepped out into the palace gardens and moved out, across the bridge to the gazebo that was built into the middle of the massive koi pond, seeking some solitude, she hadn't exactly realized that she cornered herself until she heard footsteps approaching at her back. She turned, eyes a little wary, not in fear but more in exasperation, hoping that whichever of the two or three people that would walk up to her like this, would just take the hint and turn around. No such luck. Takeshio smiled disarmingly a small plate with daifuku cakes on it, holding it up to her like some peace offering. Which it was, given her sweet tooth. She scowled. That wasn't fair, and he knew it too. Would you like some? He asked with a pleasant smile of pearly white teeth. Stop pretending those things aren't for me. She glared at him. You hate sweets. I may have gotten a craving. He smirked, but nevertheless, stepped closer to hand her the plateful of pastries. She took them. Thanks. 
You can go now, I'm sure you're busy. She hinted. Nope. He grinned with willful obliviousness, stepping around her to sit on one of the benches. Father is bringing himself up to speed since his absence. Leaving me, free to do whatever I please for the next few hours. And as of now it pleases me to be here. She took a breath and just held back from releasing an aggravated sigh. She didn't leave though. She was here first after all. Let him leave. Come on. She groused, taking a bite. You must have something better to do than sit here and try to give me some kind of pep talk. He blinked. Oh. Is that what I'm doing? I was just feeding the fish. Out of the folds of his robe he pulled out a handful of feed for the koi fish. She glared. Oh screw you. He smirked, as though reading her disrespectful thoughts. Did you perhaps, want a pep talk? I will hurt you. Treason. He mock gasped. I should call my protection detail, he chuckled and spread some of the feed onto the water below, watching as the fish congregated instantly, long used to the random feedings they received from passerbys every now and again along with the groundskeeper who fed them every morning and every night. She turned her eyes away from him, looking down at the black waters of the pond. A short silence fell between them, one that he broke. Takeshio took a breath through his nose. You don't need a pep talk Kurotsuchi. You don't need anything. They will come and you will go with them. They are your family. It's not that simple. He smiled. Isn't it? If it isn't, you'll do what you'll always do. Overcome. We've all seen you do it before. This time will be no different. I thought you said you weren't here to give a pep talk. She snarked, smiling his way. The koi fish don't mind sharing my attentions. He quipped back. Gee, I feel so privileged. Fish give me competition on the important scale. They are very pretty fish. He justified with a smile. She laughed under her breath. He was like his father, a smart answer for everything. She let herself take a breath, taking the last bite of her pastry before she rubbed her fingers against each other to wipe the crumbs off, watching as they fell to the water, the fish immediately coming to the food, swimming away from Takeshio's group, towards her meager offerings. He smiled will miss you, you know? She opened her mouth, then closed it. She couldn't say it, not anymore. She was going back to Iwa now. Going back to her home. And this, friendship had to, if not die, at the very least be left here. It wasn't something she could take with her. That's just how it worked. How it had to be. She let the words die in her throat and spoke a wholly inadequate, thanks instead. He smiled you'll always have a place here if you so choose. Only your father can give that invitation. She smiled trying to take the bite out of the sentence with a show of teeth. He raised an eyebrow, he smiled still there. Do you think he'll say anything different? She swallowed, knowing the answer. The daimyo's son stood, reaching into the folds of his robe. Here. I have a gift for you. She blinked, looking at him as he held his hand out. Something, wrapped in green silk was in his hand. She reached forward, picking it from his hand. And what's this now? She unrolled it finding a gorgeous hawk hair pin. The animal had a body of sapphire, with the feathers on its wings glinting with green emeralds. She opened her mouth, unsure of exactly what to say when, just as they had a day or so ago when Koto arrived in the middle of the night, the crier's voice echoed through the halls and the tower bells began to toll. Her grandfather was here. X. When she ran out to the main courtyard, where every servant and readily available warrior was making his or her way to be present and accounted for, her grandfather was already there, standing in the middle of the courtyard a dozen onbu level shinobi right at his side. That was. A lot of potential battle strength for a simple meeting. Koto however, seemed completely unfazed as she heard him speak in that same, familiar little drawl he usually did. She could almost liken it to that same, half-amused tone when his infant daughter Sasami pulled some particularly impressive escape from her nannies. Ryoutenbin. You're looking well. She could almost imagine his smile as he looked down the steps at the man. You're still fast I almost didn't have time to stand properly. If it's all the same to you the diminutive cage straightened his robe. I'd rather dispense with the pleasantries and see this done with, Mega Jiro Dono. Where is my granddaughter? Hmm. She heard the man breathe, likely and thought more than irritation if she knew him well. He turned, looking over the crowd, before finding her there and smiling. Kurotsuchi. She took a deep, steadying breath as the servants she'd arrived behind, and was more than willing to use as a human shield, 
noticed her presence in their midst moved themselves aside, bowing to her as they did, allowing her grandfather a clear line of sight. He didn't smile, but she did see his eyes soften just a bit, noticed how hands that were clenched tightly behind his back came down to his side as he straightened his back just a bit. He looked her up and down, eyes searching before he spoke with an awkward cough. You, let your hair grow. Her hand reflexively moved to her hair, the locks were still short, cut just above her neck, but it was a change from the even shorter cut beforehand which just basically covered her skull with an inch or two of hair. Yeah. She answered a little stupidly. Would he want her to cut it? He shifted to face her fully, his stiffness gave away his awkwardness. It looked like they were both feeling it. She supposed he should sense, he was the one that kind of lost her because of a goddamn bad. She had plenty of time to get over it but it still rankled whenever she thought of it too long. Well, come here. It's been six years. I've got to get a better look at you. She obeyed. Stepping forward, past the crowd. She stood in front of her relative and felt all eyes on her. It was not a pleasant feeling. He blinked. You, you've been trained. It was a statement, not a question, and it was more surprise than anything else she detected in that statement. She nodded. With his experience her training was obvious to the naked eye. She doubt she could have hidden it from him or these Anbu even if she tried. She didn't know what to say. Couldn't read him. Was he angry? Disappointed? Happy? Or just in shock? Was I not supposed to do that? Koto's amused voice made her grandfather snap back into place his features closing off to reveal a bored detachment once again as he turned to the bearded daimyo of Hai no Kuni. The ruler was smirking. You never said she should have remained a Janan. Forgive me if I overstepped Anaki. I meant no offense. You have given none. Her grandfather answered, irritated. Who were her tutors? I'm sure Kurotsuchi will answer if you ask her. Still, those are all things we can discuss once we're done with a meal that had been prepared. Come, it will get cold if we wait out here much longer. And with that the daimyo turned, waiting for neither word nor protest before he was walking back to the palace. Her grandfather opened his mouth, but she saw him click it shut, glaring at Koto's back as the man turned and marched away. Was it curiosity or politeness that stayed his tongue? Either way he soon followed after the man, whatever protests he had, for a time at least, were suppressed. She released a sigh of relief. So far, the next great war hadn't started. She'd take it, and count it as a win. X. It can be said that while, usually Naruto didn't particularly mind sitting at these meetings with Yuagao and Mei, neither did he particularly love it either. I mean sure, the politics and meandering negotiations were somewhat fun to watch, knowing that once upon a time his dream was to be Hokage. But he wasn't doing the negotiating, the haggling, and so the novelty quickly simmered off to something tolerable at best. But still, given the rather abrupt development this meeting seems to have taken he was rather glad today was his turn all things considered. Beside him, Yuagao blinked. Come again? May smiled, her head leaning against her fist it's a rather interesting notion, and the more I think on it the more interested I am. You're suggesting an exchange of shinobi? Only temporary of course. The auburn-haired cage waved away her tone as an afterthought, smirking as she leaned forward, leering at him specifically. Tell me, how much did you learn from Iwagakur's little princess in your time abroad with the damyo of Hai no Kuni? Uh, quite a bit? He asked more than answered, looking to Yuagao to see if he should say anything at all. This was, frankly, coming out of left field really and he had no idea how to proceed. And did she learn from you? Yeah. He nodded. Frankly he taught her more she taught him, but then again he was like, plenty older than her. And fought in a war that marked the end of the world so it wasn't at all fair to compare. May looked to Yuagao, smug and smiling. I'd be interested in a similar exchange with your village. I Yuagao cleared her throat. I'm not authorized to give, any kind of. Oh I know you can't say yes or no right now dear. She let her smile get a little wider. This is just a flight of fancy. It won't affect anything we've discussed and settled on so far I trust. Merely present this little inquiry to Sarutobi. You will be leaving after all in. Three more days Yuagao answered, both women pretending they didn't already know. Right I'll have a letter for you to take when you go. She seemed to sit straighter, a sudden idea in her head that brought a gleam to her eye. Ah. Now that would be an interesting. What? Naruto asked, his own curiosity begging the question. Well, 
rather than send a student who can only learn so much in such a relatively short time, why do we not exchange Jiaon and Sensei to teach a team of Jinan for a time? Naruto allowed his eyes to narrow a bit in suspicion. He'd fought alongside Mei for quite a long time, in that time he'd grown a sense of respect for the strong, assertive woman. He also grew a sense over time of when she had some other thought, lurking around in her head, besides the one she was telling you about. Hmm, what was she up to now? A Jounen exchange wasn't something he'd ever heard of, even before the war. Why would she want it now? Hell, the closest thing was shinobi ambassadors like Tamari. And that was rare and far between. Half of him suspected the only reason Tamari even went that far was because she fancied Shika, though God only knew why. It couldn't just be the story of him and Kurotsuchi training together with the daimyo that was making her do this. What did she have to gain? Did she want to get her hands on Konoha techniques? Nah, couldn't be. Same as Kiri, Konoha would get their hands on Kirigakura teachings as well so that didn't make sense. She wasn't after an equivalent exchange. How would Kiri profit more than Konoha from this? What did they have to gain that Hai no Kuni didn't? He wasn't smart enough to figure it out right now. He'd have to think on it more, and definitely would have to talk with the old man about it when they got back in a few days. He looked at May's soft smile, half hidden behind her fiery auburn hair. Despite himself he almost smiled back. It was nice to see her enjoying herself again. It had been a while. I mean, sure she was trying to pull one over them somehow but still. Good for her enjoying the simple pleasures and all that. He giggled and wasn't really able to stop for a while at the sheer absurdity of his roundabout thoughts, even when Mei and Yuagao gave him looks of curiosity and admonishment respectively. X. The afternoon meal was a tense affair. The members of the daimyo's court tried to hide it of course, carrying on with their conversations and meandering concerns, trying to ignore the presence of the dozen Iwagakura Anbu who stood at the edges of the room. Both unable, and more importantly unwilling to take their masks off. He wasn't sure where Konoha's famous twelve guardians were. Correction. He knew they were here, two of them had allowed a moment of picture-perfect clarity as to where they were the second he entered the room before vanishing completely from his sight and senses. How many of them there were however was a different matter. Either way, his men didn't partake in the meal, but Anaki did. He'd sat at Megajiro Koto's left. The man's son, Takeshio sat at his right and Kurotsuchi sat at Anaki's left, the tension in her body was palpable, she'd sat stiff as a board for the whole meal. He couldn't remember the last time his granddaughter was afraid or nervous and it made him wonder just how she'd been treated these years to cause such a reaction so readily. Now though the meal was done, a slow roasted duck served with eels, dumplings and a steamed rice. It had been good, as should be expected by the cooks of a daimyo's court, though he was careful to only serve himself from bowls Koto himself took from. He noted his granddaughter was not nearly so careful. The servants and serfs approached from the side rooms to collect the plates, bowls and silverware. The nobles and advisors fell silent, as though waiting for some acknowledgement from their daimyo. Finally, Koto stood, hands disappearing into the folds of his elegant red robe. Anaki, will you walk with me? He nodded, glad to finally be able to speak in private. Frankly, he didn't need or want the meal. Koto should have just cut straight to it rather than waste his time like this. He looked to Kurotsuchi at his side. Could you? He cleared his throat. Might you get your things ready? We will be leaving shortly. She nodded. Sure. He stood and together, both leaders began to march through the halls. Their exit area was isolated and he sensed no one, not even the daimyo's twelve guardian shinobi. Though that could be a testament to their skill rather than their absence. As they walked and the silence dragged on, he was abhorred to be the first to break it, but the day was dragging on and he had no intention of staying in this place. By tonight, if he were to have any say they would be at least halfway to the border. How has she been these last six years? He asked. Neutral enough. Depending on his answer he could discern exactly what the fire daimyo intended to gain or accomplish today. Content. Koto answered quickly. She missed her family however. Did she? He drawled, eyeing the man. Lord only knows what lies they put in his granddaughter's head about her family. Hmm. The daimyo nodded. She trained hard to impress you and her father more than anything else I suspect. Ah yes, the training. I did not believe you would have allowed her to train. My guard certainly protested enough at the decision. The man laughed. They reached the gardens, a great peach tree with a large koi pond dominated the view. They tell me she is a match for any jounin now. 
Perhaps you're Jounin. He mentally snarled. I see. I'm sure that will ease her father's worries. And yours, he said flatly walking out into the garden. Anaki frowned. Who trained her? Now now you know better. The daimyo laced his hands behind his back. If anyone would tell you it would be Kurotsuchi. Their identities are not mine to give. That Tsuchikage sneered. Of course, place me in the position to ask her to betray the confidence of her tutors. Would he have to look at his granddaughter for the rest of her life as some kind of Konoha sympathizer? A potential defector? Contrary to what you might think Anaki I did not take your granddaughter to hold her hostage. I did not take her for ambition or spite. No you just took her because you know exactly where to strike to make a wound bleed. He shot back, glaring. Hmm. The man nodded. I suppose I do. You gave up the chance to kill my son. One of my strongest Jounin. You cannot possibly expect me to believe you did that out of, what? Mercy. I've seen your machinations at hand before. I've seen that ruthless mind and forked tongue at work. My memory is long if you'll recall and that includes your crimes Megajiro. I have made no claim to sainthood. I am merely a man getting on in his years who would simply prefer to work on his calligraphy than his sword work. Spend time with his daughter than in a field of battle waging war and campaigns. Anaki raised an eyebrow. Was this weakness? Or another clever trap? Something to make him overconfident? Invoke a misstep? A miscalculation, like Orochimaru had during those Chonin exams? Koto took a breath, closing his eyes as he raised his face up to the sky, the high afternoon sun spearing down to bathe sunlight over the both of them. No, now is not the time is it? The question was rhetorical, more of the man talking to himself than to Anaki before he raised his hand go then he said, waving him away without even turning. A blind man could see you're only more concerned about an ambush. Now is not the time for talks. Take your granddaughter with you Anaki if you're interested in opening a dialogue contact me again when you return home. We'll meet at a time and place of your choosing within my borders. Anaki stared at the man's back. You're serious about this, you want to open talks? Now? That more than anything else was the most baffling. If he truly wanted to move Iwa into a more permanent peace agreement rather than the tenuous truce they had right now it would have been best to force the issue whilst Kurotsuchi was still their hostage. When a treaty has been forced rather than agreed it serves as less of a bulwark and more akin to kindling for the flames of war. He threw a look over his shoulder at the diminutive cage. How much would a forced treaty compel you? It wouldn't. He admitted. Even well-established agreements like the Chonin exam could be discarded when the situation demanded it, as it had years ago. I thought so. The man nodded again. Go. And only if you wish to entertain the notion of peace of your own will should you bother to contact me again. He turned and began to walk further into the garden, marching towards the gazebo built out into the middle of the pond. The Tsuchikage stared at the man's back, snorting once before turning around to march back the way they came. Peace? the man that had over a dozen victories under his belt. He'd led men to war and death for three decades as readily as any of the five cage. And now he wanted to talk peace? Why? To what end? What game was he playing? He knew well enough how a pleasant smile and beguiling words could lead to a death far more effectively than any technique or blade. And Mega Jiro Koto was better than most at utilizing such weapons. He'd smile at your face as he watched the knife coming into your back. X. Maybe it's some infiltration scheme. Ryoko suggested, laying down at the couch, legs akimbo as she stared up at the ceiling, waiting for dinner to be done. That's always a possibility, but it doesn't explain why she'd offer to take in one of our own. We can infiltrate just as easily. Yuugao explained, her eyes panning over a sealed book, a new one. Intelligence gathering is a possibility but there's not much a foreign shinobi under watch could discover. Naruto paced up and down the walls, literally. So if it's not infiltration and it's not intelligence gathering, maybe it's just what she says. The three women gave distinct answers in the form of a snort, a laugh and a stare, but identical in their dismissal. Naru-chan Ryoko laughed it's nice you found yourself a little girlfriend with Haku-chan here but not all Kiri Nin are cute and nice like her. No 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 no. He fell off the wall, landing on his feet. What is it that Kiri has more than any other village? It took a second for the girls to realize he was actually serious before they answered. Bloodlines? Kyofu ventured from the kitchen. It was her turn today. Yeah, exactly. He smiled. 
They've got bloodline users and those uptight assholes only ever learn to use techniques revolving around their bloodlines. They've got strong bloodlines but not so strong non-bloodline users. You guess they're falling behind. Yu Agao mused. Think about it. He nodded, grinning. They've got the bone guys, ice wielders, Mei herself has two keke genkai, they've got dujutsu and all other kinds of crazy things like shark men, but who's the strongest non-bloodline wielder they got? Zabuza. Half the non-bloodline wielder Jounin and Konoha have a chance at beating him. We just have more techniques to balance out. Most of their techniques are water-based, and without a river, lake or ocean nearby they're even weaker than normal. Yu Agao leaned back in her seat, thinking. Hmm. Since neither side would ever dream of giving the other a bloodline wielder for risk of losing the bloodline, we'd give them a non-bloodline Jounin and he'd teach a batch of fresh, new techniques to three students. And if the first one is a success. And she convinces us to do it again on a wider scale. Next time it's three Jounin we exchange, twelve students in total. But that'll take years to get their non-bloodline guys up to par. Ryoko sat up, blinking her confusion. What's the alternative? Naruto shrugged. How else are they going to supplement their subpar non-bloodline ninja? Outside of random defectors or some genius ninja that invents his own slew of techniques what can they do? Yuugao nodded. It's, definitely something to consider, it's not a coincidence that she'd make this proposal now when the Jinan exams have just finished either. Naruto blinked. The Jinan exams. He trailed his eyes up to the ceiling. That's right, Sasuke and Sakura would have graduated now. They'd be making Team 7. It felt like a sucker punch. Where did the time go? Suddenly, he was glad they'd be heading home in another day or two. Chapter 28 To Naruto, Yuugao, Ryoko and Kyofu the overhead canopy of leaves was a comfort to them as they drew closer to the village. They'd actually chosen to walk on the last mile or so of the journey, take in the scenery rather than bull rush straight through like someone owed them money back home. Hadn't even been a spoken thing really. Their pace had just slowed. Then finally, almost their Naruto, of all people, dropped down to the road below and just walked. The others didn't put up much of a fuss. As they eventually reached, and entered the village itself the, idyllic nature of their return persisted, grew even. The people went about their day to day, the sun was shining, the air smelled crisp and fresh. They even got to the Hokage Tower and gave their report without incident. There were a few raised eyebrows with May's proposal and his theory as to the why for it, but outside of that, it was smooth sailing. They left each other's company with smiles and hugs, polite handshake in Yugao's case at any rate with everyone getting their pay and making their way home. Everything seemed fine. Then he got home. That's when he found her. Oh shit. Were the first words out of his mouth after he opened his door. He dropped his travel bag and rushed into his room. The groan that left Itachi's lips as he gently rolled her over made his heart drop. He'd never ever heard Itachi even grunt in pain. In either lifetime. Oh, oh shit, what are you doing here? What happened? Why aren't you in a hospital? He pulled the sheets free where he noticed some of the damage. A slight burn on her left shoulder from an electric technique, more than a few light scratches with one bad cut just over her right knee, bruises covered her torso. Her eyes fluttered open her upper lip curled as she shifted in the bed. The examinations to become a hunter nin, were more trying than I expected. Why the hell aren't you at a hospital? He repeated his question before shaking his head and standing up. Never mind, I'll get your stuff and we'll gee. Her hand lashed out gripping his wrist with such force it actually hurt, as though she'd forgotten to check her strength, or maybe she was just that desperate to stop him. No, she hissed. No. No hospitals. I can't go to way she stopped hissing in a sharp pain. Why the hell not? He asked, baffled. My she groaned leaning back, her head thumping against the headboard. I haven't been accepted yet, the hospital will have to inform my father. If he finds out he'll try to affect my acceptance. He blinked, shaking his head, dumbstruck. If it makes you feel any better I'll kick your dad in the balls if he shows up, but I have too. The grip on his wrist tightened, and Itachi's eyes opened, glaring at him with all the fury and anger she had in her. I, she bit out. Have not undergone a month of innumerable tortures, tests and hell, to fail now because of him, or you. She swallowed, and emotion colored her next words. Either help me or don't, but don't sabotage me. He took a breath and, said nothing. He didn't know what to say. Insist she go to the hospital? Reassure her? Thank her? 
when he finally found his voice, the words that came to him were. Okay. He placed his hand over hers, coaxing her to ease the death grip she held over his wrist. Okay, let me get my first aid kit at least, I'll try to help, okay? She nodded, head moving in stiff jerky movements as her eyes fluttered closed and the pain made itself known again. XXXX. Iwo was like a stone. Large, imposing, and barely changed with the passage of time. The massive stone slabs that were the village's main gate opened as they arrived with a horn sounding from above and a creak of ancient, well-maintained hinges. She didn't think it possible to have ever matched the nervousness she felt at the moment just before she'd met her grandfather again, but this was rapidly proving that wrong. Back there, there were people she knew surrounding her. People who had been with her for six years. Encouraged her, helped her. Helped raise her. There were people here. A million strangers that never seen her face. Knew nothing about her. Yet they all knew of her and were no doubt eager to see the spectacle that was her return to Iwagakur. Eager to judge her. This was nothing like her grandfather. This was a mob and she knew they each had an opinion before she'd even made it halfway past the border. She felt like she was standing at the edge of a knife and at the very bottom of the ravine was the inescapable fact that she was going to be found wanting. It was a bitter pill to swallow. Knowing that despite all her hard work, or perhaps even because of it, her countrymen were going to look at her like something, different, unwelcome even. Her grandfather didn't really help in assuaging her fears. The majority of their conversations consisted of something she could only call a softball interrogation. Question after question revolving around her tutelage, her teachers, her skills. Over and over again. And when he got wind of Naruto being there it was like a whitewash. All he could ask about was that Namikaze. What his skill level was, who was he living with, why hadn't they seen him, what foods did he like to eat. She said he liked tofu. The last thing she wanted to be a cause of was Naruto being found dead by poisoned ramen. His interest in her seemed secondary to his interest in the information she could provide him. Was he just a prelude to everyone else? Is this what they wanted her back for? Would this be her father's reaction as well? These are not comforting questions. And when the massive gates finally open and they step into the village proper it's to a crowd of faces that cheer at their arrival. She doesn't recognize a single one of them. XXXX. Did you learn to stitch during your war? The question was soft, given by a young woman whose eyes stayed closed and who remained leaning back in the bed, as still as possible. As though just her mind was awake and the rest of the body wished to stay in the stillness of sleep. Your war. That's what she always calls it for lack of a better term. It's all she, or he can think of. The only thing that fits. It was his war. Not hers. Not Sasuke's or Sakura's. Not yet. And hopefully not ever. He was the only one that ever experienced it. The only one that lived it. That would live it. So yes, in a way she was right, and he couldn't begrudge her the way she said it. It was his war. But the question still stood, and it made him smile. I actually learned to stitch my own clothes a lot sooner than that. Hmm. She breathed as the heated, disinfected needle and medical thread pierced her numb skin of her leg. Stitching up people wasn't much different than stitching clothes. This, this was the easy part you know. He breathed, continuing his work. Lips tight. This will only get worse after this, Toby is stronger, the people around him are. Naruto. He heard her breathe. Shut up. I'm sorry. He tried to smile but it was difficult. This is exactly what he didn't want to happen. What he didn't want to see again. His friends in pain because of him. But still, he supposed he should say it, she hadn't heard it yet and she deserved to hear it as often as possible from him from now on. Thank you. Itachi, for all of this, I mean it. HN. She grunted, nodding and he was grateful she didn't make a show of it. The baby blue towel he'd placed under her leg was stained red with blood and splotched with medical alcohol. It had done the job of saving his mattress and sheets. It had also saved something else. You know he commented as he smirked sardonically. I've lived twice so far and I've yet to meet anyone with hair this long in either lifetime. It was true, Itachi's hair was splayed across the bed like a curtain of midnight, the length of hair trailed all the way down, nearly to her knees. Her lips tugged upwards in the slightest of smirks. I'll take that as a compliment. It was the smallest bit of vanity she allowed herself, well deserved really. She took excellent care of the impossibly long mass of hair. Even Jiraiya kept his hair only to his back or so. 
though he often used ninjutsu to grow it out as a defense. Did Itachi have something similar? It wouldn't surprise him. But still. I know a few hair-based ninjutsu, if you like I can teach you. Jiraiya most often used his defensive variant. That silver mess of his could become harder than steel. But there were others. More offensive types that she might prefer. He eyes fluttered open. You don't have the hair for it. He shrugged. They're not that difficult. Hair is a natural extension of the body so they're kinda easy to learn. Just need a little imagination and a lot of hair. I don't have enough but you do. Probably help with your genjutsu. I'll keep it in mind, she said. He remembered when Sakura chose to cut her hair. Remembered that it was because another kunoichi had grabbed hold of her longer hair back during their first chonin exam. Itachi probably had like a half dozen contingencies for someone trying to do that. Probably had a means of just cutting it right off if she was really desperate. Hopefully she never would be. He smirked. Oops, he said as convincingly as possible, staring down at the injury as he threaded the stitch. He received a solid smack to the back of his head for his effort. Not falling for that. She muttered. He grinned despite the abuse to his skull. Hey, I remember when I did it to Sakura, she got so. He paused, drifting off into memory before he shook himself out of it. The previous cheer dying away like wax under one of Sasuke's fire jutsu. When will you go see them? She asked, breaking the silence that fell over them. He shrugged. Soon? It was so hesitant it couldn't even be qualified as a statement. Tomorrow, she declared. He looked at her, eyes sad, but not arguing. He was terrified, but he did want to see thee again. Even if they, even if they weren't his Sasuke and Sakura. Tomorrow, he agreed. He finished his work and closed the first aid kit, making a mental note to replace the special needle and medical thread as soon as possible as he put away the disinfectant and gathered the waste to throw it out. I apologize again for the subpar homecoming. She drawled, her eyes still closed. May. He shrugged with a smile parties are overrated. Besides I was getting rusty with my stitching, it was nice of you to volunteer to be my practice dummy. He ducked out of her reach, laughing as she tried to smack the back of his head again. XXXX. The fanfare is soon over, that is to say, she evades it. Her grandfather gave a small speech in the village square. Nothing grandiose. More of an announcement that his granddaughter was home. The people cheered and clapped, alien faces smiled at her as she waved back at them as expected of her. Then her grandfather declared this to be a day for celebration. Though it seemed spontaneous, it was all to rehearse to really be believable as spontaneous. He'd been planning this for a while. The people cheered and soon enough the shops were closing and the stands were coming alive with people ordering food and drink that was quickly served, the chun-nin that had been holding back the crowd let them through. The people came forward in groups to see her, congratulate her, question her. It's not long before she found the attention stifling as she stood there, lambasted by a dozen strangers shooting off rapid-fire questions. Gossips and would-be socialites were all eager to welcome her back, be the first friend she gets after her long time kept away as the fire daimyo's trophy prisoner. She slips away the second she has a moment to do so spreading Tsuchi bunshines through the throngs of people to leave them lingering for a time so as not to be so obvious. Then, she's all but vanishing with all the speed and stealth she could muster, winding her way through old, familiar roads and ducks into the veneers of long-remembered shops that have changed little over the years. She's got very little doubt her grandfather knows she's gone. Has even less doubt at least one pair of eyes are watching her but can't really bring herself to care either way. She doesn't want to be there, so she won't. Parties aren't her thing. She starts making her way home trying not to think of the fact that her father hadn't come to see her. The path was just as she remembered really. Past the pottery shop, around the corner from the weapon vendor and up the hill. By the time she arrived the music from the town square was already playing. The people were cheering, drinking and laughing, eager for a reason to celebrate and forget about their troubles for a few hours even though that reason is no longer strictly in their midst. She hovered at the foot of the stairs for a time, hesitating. She reached into one of her pockets, searching for her keys, wondering if they still worked staring up at the door that now seemed more imposing than the village gates. She took a breath. Nothing for it. She decided. She marched up the stairs put in her key, and opened her door. Immediately, a smell hit her. Food. Familiar. She stepped inside, wondering if she should be quiet or not. The furniture had been moved around from what she remembered. A new table bought. 
She panned her eyes around, hearing the hiss of cooking food on the skillet. She stepped further, marching towards the kitchen. I was hoping I'd get to have it ready before you arrived. She heard her father's voice before ever seeing him, and he steps out of the kitchen, rounding its doorway to the hall with a gentle, almost hesitant smile on his face as he looks at her. There's no look of surprise there. No one else that he might have been expecting. Just a smile and a stupid apron. You, still like glazed Hamachi I hope. She doesn't anymore. But she'll learn to like it again. She smiled and opened her mouth to speak before she cuts herself off, too worried that she'd choke before she nods. He nods. I uh, you should get changed if you like. Eden and Akatsu Chi should be dropping by once their shifts are over. They wanted to see you. She smiled. Yeah. This is a homecoming she could enjoy. No strangers. Just friends. XXXX. The next morning Itachi woke to painkillers that had already worn off and a dull ache, everywhere. She groaned, shifting on the bed, trying to remain asleep. But it's too late, her mind was already pulling itself from the fugue with the smell of food coming from the kitchen and her stomach suddenly deciding to remind her that it had been nearly 24 hours since she last ate. She didn't move slow. If she tried she'd never move at all. Instead she moved in a quick burst of movement. All but shoving herself off of the bed to sit up, swiveling her legs off the mattress to plant them on the floor. Scratches of pain slashed across her stomach, thighs and arms. The groan of pain she bit down by sheer will alone before she shoved herself off the bed to stand. She turned and marched out of Naruto's room, noting, of course, that he wasn't on the couch anymore. Stepping out into the hall and into the dining room, she found him in the kitchen. She gripped the chair, taking a deep breath to try and focus through some of the pain. You can sit down you know. She opened her eyes, glaring at Naruto who stepped out of the kitchen, with a smile on his face, pulling the scrambled eggs free to serve them onto a plate that had already been set, waiting for her. She would have sat down, if she really didn't want to move any further. Minutes later though, they were at the table, with Naruto slurping on a bowl of ramen to her serving of eggs, cooked ham and steamed potatoes. So. He slurped and swallowed. You were a little out of it yesterday so I didn't ask, but what exactly did they do to you? She swallowed. Four-week processing. She answered. Psychological examinations for three days, then, a written exam, combined with an exam to see through Genjutsu. You passed that one with flying colors I imagine. He smirked. It was difficult. Translation. Fucking impossible for anyone else. The questions were scrambled, the words were backwards, the lines to answer them ask you, the space to answer overlapping questions, questions that were cut halfway with others. She groaned. The mere memory apparently bringing her headache back at full bore. At least 15 illusions overlapping each other, I couldn't eliminate two before they replaced the first one I broke through. He chewed on his noodles. Sounded tough as hell. Then? Then, then they interrogated me, she said. The previous exam made up a code. They knew what it was already of course but they wanted to test and see how well I stood up to non-invasive interrogation, they used Jinja to, drugs. Sometimes I felt as though I was down there for months even though I knew it had only been for a few minutes or hours. How'd you keep track? He asked softly, the guilt nodding in his gut. He hadn't asked this of her, but he hadn't stopped her either. Kept count. She drawled. 1,002,373 seconds. Two weeks? He hissed. Even after just two to three days, even knowing that they were in friendly territory, perhaps even because of it most people would have cracked. Given up. Undergoing torture, even non-invasive practices for that amount of time was. She nodded, though if it was to his question, or his tone he didn't know. After that they released me, gave me three days to physically recover. After that it was the physical portion of the exam. What you'd expect. All of the disciplines. Finally it was a combat test that lasted a week. What did you have to do? Hunt, she stated flatly. Five targets. Three days. Forest of Chonin, one Jounin and one Anbu. No information. No intelligence. Tracking and finding them while keeping myself hidden. He winced. That, was insane. Ninja relied on time, preparation, opportunity. To have to run around the length and breadth of the forest of death, tracking, covering your tracks, stalking, setting up traps, finding the right opportunity to attack, avoiding injury finding a secure place to rest, resting, avoiding the traps that they placed. 
all that in three days when just a week before she'd been tortured for half a goddamn month, it was goddamn insane. No wonder there were so few Hunter Nin. I. She swallowed, the next words coming difficult. The Anbu, dressed himself as a Chonin. Nearly had me. He's the one that cut you? He almost wanted to go find the guy. That did look like a wound from an Anbu blade, he said taking another slurp of noodles. She nodded. It was she took a breath regardless, it's done. They'll decide soon. She tossed him a look. You have somewhere else to be right now. He nodded. More eagerly than last night. Yeah I know. Don't worry I won't back out. Good, because now that I'm not half dead on painkillers there's something you should know. He blinked, raising an eyebrow in curiosity. Yeah? Hatake Kakashi is still on Bu Captain. Chapter 29 for Haruno Sakura, life, for these past few weeks had been, somewhat disappointing. Outside of the fact that she was on a team with Sasuke, which was definitely something to smile about, the rest of the week since her graduation was pretty much hit after hit after hit to her expectations. Firstly, their class was a man short, which means her team in particular was a man short. Not only that, apparently less sensei had volunteered this year than what was needed, given that her class was particularly large and so since her and Sasuke were a man short, they also got the short end when it came to the assignments. Add to that the fact that she'd learned from others that there was yet another test waiting for them after this that they might fail anyway like some of her friends and acquaintances already had and all in all she could say that her expectations for this getting better were getting further and further away. Especially when her experience so far seemed to be so far below the standard she'd heard of. Hell, to hear some of the adults tell it, Genin teams were a second family that became even more beloved than actual family, but so far, all she'd seen of Sasuke was his back as he'd left the school last week which would have been a disappointment in and of itself, even without her romantic dreams being cast aside. As she made her way back up to her room after having breakfast however, she received something of a surprise. It was a note. A sticky note to be exact, plastered over the window at the top of the stairs. She blinked, squinting as she looked through the glass to read the note stuck outside. Sakura, training ground 17 at 11. She noted that in two hours was scratched out, probably because the writer realized that he had no way of knowing when exactly she'd read this. P.S., by the way, left a few of these around the house, don't be surprised if you find more of them? She wondered where exactly this person had left notes when she looked down at her watch and realized she only had about 40 minutes to get there and had absolutely no idea where the hell training ground 17 even was. Crap. XXXXX. Almost 37 minutes later she was wheezing, out of breath as she ran into training ground 17. Still on time if only by that much. Are you alright? Sasuke's voice was normally a choir of angel songs to her, but right now, all she had in her was the ability to raise her hand, one finger held up as she leaned on her knees, trying to gulp down air. It was a minute later that she finally straightened, exhaling an answer between her inhales. Sorry, ran, all the way, here. The raven-haired boy shrugged his shoulders. Fine. Guess he got to my house first. How much time did you have when you finally found the note? Forty minutes. She answered. Had to find out where this was though, a little out of the way. He nodded in agreement. Yeah. The training ground, such as it was, was all but abandoned. The grass wasn't cut, the dirt packed tight and dry. It didn't seem like it had been used in years. That and it was sitting on the mesa just behind the Hokage monument she could actually see the crest of the Hokage's various foreheads just to the west of her right now. Who in the hell would put a training ground right behind one of the most important landmarks of the village? What if it got damaged? Ha, huh, guess that explained why no one had used it. So who do you think our new teammate's gonna be? She blinked, rounding about to look at Sasuke. Ha? Huh? Our new. She shrugged. You got the rookie of the year spot Sasuke-kun so it's not gonna be anyone nearly as good as you. Thanks, but that's not really an answer, he said, looking away. She was about to open her mouth to speak again when suddenly. Hands. Two hands spurted out of the ground around Sasuke's ankles and the next thing she, or Sasuke even knew, he's buried up to his neck. Hey. What the hell? She's too shocked to do much other than stare stupidly. The thought of drawing a kunai doesn't even cross her mind before a voice cuts through Sasuke's muttered curses. Ha 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 ha. I've been wanting to do that since forever. She turned her eyes up, behind Sasuke where someone rose up out of the ground like a mutant cabbage from hell or something, 
giggling to himself like it was the funniest thing in the world to have buried Sasuke up to his neck in dirt. It was a chonin she realized somewhere distantly as she caught sight of the vest, a chonin that couldn't be any older than her. Was he, was he actually shorter than her? Whoever it was grinned, standing up and beginning to walk closer he twiddled a stick in his hand, crouching to Sasuke's left he proceeded to poke the Uchiha in the temple with it. She realized then that yes he was indeed slightly shorter than her. Nay, Sakura-chan. How long before you think before Sasu-chan tries to bite the stick eh? Stop poking me you ass. Sasuke howled, the stump of his neck moving his head this way and that way to avoid the wandering wooden utensil. Her brain, which seems to have just burned out its clutch with the recent, rapid shifting of gears, finally seemed to right itself. Who the hell are you? She shouted, indignant on Sasuke's behalf as she marched over and ripped the stick right out of his hand. The blonde Chonin actually threw his hands over his head, as though bracing himself for that same stick to get broken over his skull, minutely painful as that might have been for anyone. But she stopped herself. She wasn't nearly so demented as to try attacking a Chonin, crazy and stupid as this one might have been. He peeked out over his hands and smiled when he realized she didn't hit him. Nay. I'm Naruto. Pleased to meet Cha. How do you know our names? Sasuke asked. And get me the hell out of here. He turned his eyes from her to Sasuke. Well, of course I know your names, you're my teammates. And Sakura felt all her expectations come crumbling down all over again. XXXXX. Kyuchi doesn't speak to his father much anymore it's true, it's an estrangement that was seated long ago with Anaki's rank and the very nature of their professions, but reached a full bloom when, six years ago Anaki had quite literally gambled away his life. His daughter's life. Every mission was a gamble, he knew. Every time he stepped beyond the village gates there was a very real possibility he wouldn't come back. But that had been different. Worse. All the other times he knew what he was walking into. Knew the risks, the inherent dangers. Even when he didn't know, and got a surprise somewhere along the way, it was with the knowledge that he was doing his job and information hadn't been deliberately kept from him. But those Chonin exams. Where Orochimaru, a literal snake of a man, one of the strongest ninja in the world basically all but confirmed Kyuchi's death if his father continued his personal vendetta and his father basically just said go ahead, that was a punch to the gut. He'd felt like a piece of garbage. Something his father hadn't even given a second look to. Had never even thought about the risk before deciding go for it. I'll get what I want. That alone would have been bad enough. Nearly irreconcilable as far as he was concerned, but there would indeed, perhaps be a chance with an apology. But when he lost Kurotsuchi, that was just the final coffin nail. Frankly, he might feel more affection towards Koto instead. The daimyo of Hai no Kuni had not only spared his life but apparently done his level best to treat her well, even going so far as to train her. She was a Chonin level easy. Likely a Jounin from what he'd seen. Given how fond he noted her voice to be yesterday as she, Akatsuchi, Eaton and he had been speaking, he got the impression there was a genuine affection on her part too. So no, he had no shortage of resentment, perhaps even disdain for his father and it was not a secret to either the village, or his father. That still didn't exempt him from answering his boss when he was called however, personal malcontent or not, the man was still the military leader of their village. So it was that he found himself standing outside his office door early in the morning, the very day after his daughter had come home after six years in captivity. Shimei, his father's personal assistant announced his arrival. Sir. Kyuchi sama is here to see you. He didn't wait for his father to beckon him in. A petty sign of disrespect but he was feeling petty today, being here when there was someone else more important that needed his attention. Thank you Shimei you may go, Anaki said. The woman bowed before she turned and marched out. The second the door clicked shut behind her his father spoke. How is she? Resting. He answered curtly. What did you want? The elder took a breath. To ask after her. She left quickly yesterday. I was worried as to how she might have been settling in. She's fine. Akatsu Chi and Eden went to see her. He was going to leave it at that, but then he chose to continue, aggravated at how the conversation was dragging on. Look, neither of us is particularly enjoying this so why don't we just cut to the chase? You tell me why you actually want me here and then I can leave and head back home. Anaki glared at him. Despite what you may think, I actually do care for you and Kuro-chan, Kyuchi. He glared right back. Finally, the old man sighed. Equally aggravated. Fine. He leaned back in his chair. 
As expected there was something more to this. When I went to Koto's palace the, daimyo made advances. Talking about possible peace talk negotiations. He raised an eyebrow in genuine surprise. You're thinking about negotiating? No one, absolutely no one that he knew of, saved for the near psychotic held more hatred for Konoha than his own father. Having sat with, consoled the families of, and buried the near thousand men the Yondaime Hokage had butchered in the last war had left that particular legacy firmly entrenched there. For him to be. Anaki snorted, cutting off that line of thought. I'm not considering negotiating any more than he is. Megajiro Koto is a silver-tongued snake and has made a career of drawing people into traps and death with his words as much as his sword. I don't trust him any farther than I'd trust Orochimaru. But what he has done is agree to a meeting somewhere in Fire Country a place of our choosing. You want to gather intelligence. He surmised. We'd never be able to breathe without them knowing within the palace. And we wouldn't be able to see significant by staying to the border. So we send you a little deeper into enemy territory. One of the one of the villages that's closer to Kanahagakur. Between the border patrols and the village defenses. And see. What if he genuinely does want to negotiate? He asked. He doesn't. Now. And if he does? Kyuchi insisted, cutting him off. If this is just one big trap as you insist this has been pretty damn elaborate. Kurotsuchi was treated well, her skills as a ninja, while untested, seemed to have been developed significantly. Why would he do that and give her back before asking you to attend some peace meeting if it was a trap? By my estimation the best time to kill you would have been when you went to go get her. His deception would have been known to all the other four nations. You had no qualms about breaking a treaty signed by all nations six years ago. The old man's jaw visibly twitched, a ready retort on his lips when Kuchi raised a hand. Look. Whatever. If you want to go in blind and possibly have the next great war on your head that's your problem. Just give me my assignment in all of this. He couldn't stand this. Couldn't stand wasting his time talking to someone who'd already made up his mind and didn't want to listen. Anaki shook his head. Exasperated? Disgusted? He didn't know and he honestly didn't care. Forget it. Just leave. Gladly. He thought before swiveling on his heel and marching out the door. He had better places to be and better people to see. XXXX. So wait, Itachi sent you? You're the Naruto guy that went with Koto-sama along with her? The Cho Nin, who they now knew as Naruto, nodded. Slurping on his noodles with a very stupid smile on his face. Yup yup. When she heard the people lined up to be sensei she said to herself dash self I know someone way more qualified and awesome than those guys. Let me ask him for a favor. So she asked, and here I am. Sasuke blinked, leaning on the table with Sakura to his left, both of them drinking tea, their bowls of ramen long since finished, sitting neatly to the side in comparison to Naruto's, something. They'd lost count. But, no offense Naruto-san but, you're just a chonin. Sakura ventured, shifting in her seat. Genin teams are supposed to have Jounin sensei, and three Janan. Naruto shrugged, slurping noisily. Sasuke just managed to keep the automatic curl of his lip off his features. Exceptions to every rule Sakura-chan. Did you know the strongest Janan team in my Chunin exam was a two-man team? He nodded to himself. Yup. Two-man teams aren't unheard of. They can even be more effective since the teacher has more time to focus on the individual Janan rather than spread himself out over three of them. And the Jounin thing. Sasuke pressed. Well you see the thing is mid-explanation Naruto stuffed an ungodly amount of noodles in his mouth. Sasuke expected him to do what any normal person would do. Chew, swallow, and continue. Instead, he chewed, and continued. MPHRF, Shurf, VBHT, Mum. Sasuke blinked. Staring. It was like two horse-drawn carriages smashing into each other, full speed. You couldn't look away. Finally, mercifully, he finished, slurping up the last of the noodles he'd stuffed his face with and swallowed. And that's why the Hokage agreed to let me teach you instead of a regular jounin. Sasuke turned and looked at Sakura whose face was completely blank. Did you catch, any of that? She shook her head. I don't think Kuji could have caught any of that. Naruto snickered and Sasuke's suspicion as to him doing that on purpose reinforced itself. Ma ma. He waved them off. Sorry. Couldn't resist. At any rate the long and short of it is, I'm just a chonin because I haven't had time to take the jounin exam yet. 
but I could probably beat half the Jounin in this village. Sasuke wasn't at all sure as to the veracity of this statement but, if he was the same Naruto that had been with Itachi in the Daimyo's palace, and she had sent him, which he honestly could believe given that he couldn't imagine why anyone would take the job of training them without something to motivate them, he guessed he could give the guy the benefit of the doubt. He just hoped the stupid and or crazy wasn't contagious. Naruto smiled at the both of them. Well. That's it for today I guess, we'll start training tomorrow. I expect. Huh? We're not getting a Janan exam? Sakura suddenly cut in, interrupting him and bringing Sasuke's eyes over to her. She blushed in slight embarrassment. Ah, uh, I mean. I'd heard that the Jounin give Janan examinations to see if they should be sent back to the academy or not, we, we're not getting one? Really? This was the first he'd heard of it. His father and mother didn't mention it. He looked back to Naruto. The Chonin shrugged. If you really want to take it. But I got a good feeling about you guys. You don't need it. Sasuke's eyes narrowed. Hey wait a minute. You're not doing this because of Itachi right? Naruto blinked. Ha, huh, we just went over this. Of course I am. She asked me too. No no. He shook his head. Are you giving us, me, a free pass on the Genin exam thing because Itachi-chan is your friend? Naruto shrugged. Not really. Like I said, I'll give it to you if you really want. But I got a feeling that you guys will pass so I'm just not willing to waste anyone's time on it. The test would waste a whole day that we could use for designing a training program instead and just get started since you guys are behind the other teams as it is. Sasuke still glared. What he said made sense but. It felt cheap. Still, he was eager to get started, and wasting any more time didn't sound at all appealing. He looked to Sakura. What do you think? He missed the look Naruto sent his way at that. Sakura shifted, almost uncomfortably in her seat. I, I guess it's fine. If Naruto sensei says. Oh god no. Naruto suddenly interrupted. No. Do not call me sensei. He pleaded, and Sasuke noted those blue eyes seemed genuinely disturbed by what Sakura had said. Just, just plain old Naruto is fine please, both of you odd, but if he was that opposed to the idea. Before anyone could break the somewhat awkward silence that fell over them Naruto cleared his throat. Right, well. I'll expect you both ready to meet up tomorrow, bright and early. He smiled, the strange mood he'd fallen into seemingly evaporating as he did. I'm gonna have so much fun. Sasuke couldn't help but notice he very pointedly excluded them in that last sentence. XXXXX. When Naruto returned to his home, it was still early, but evening was rapidly approaching. He arrived to find his refrigerator full of the groceries he'd completely forgotten about today and Itachi sitting at the dining table, a book in her hand. How are you feeling? He asked. Well enough to go out and get food. She answered placidly before turning her eyes up towards him, staring rather pointedly. How did it go? He nodded. Well enough. But. She prodded. He opened his mouth, then closed it. She stared. Naruto. It, it's stupid. He admitted. Just, it's, there. Not the same people. She finished for him. He nodded, walking over towards the table to sit across from her. Told you it was stupid, he laughed, trying to inflect some humor in his voice. It just kinda hit me halfway through, probably when Sakura called me sensei. He paused. Felt like Tsunade hit me in the gut. Came the admission. She said nothing, and he was grateful for that. He sucked down a breath through his teeth. Whatever, I already had ramen would you like something to eat? She didn't, she'd already eaten. She asked him to make dome borimono. He nodded, smiling more genuinely now that he had something else on his mind. He stepped into the kitchen and she returned to her book. Chapter 30 Okay then. To design a proper training program I need to know what you can both do he said as he reached one of the vacant training grounds, smiling as he sat himself down, legs crossed. Sasuke and Sakura sat down in front of him. Listening with rapt attention. Sasuke wasn't standing with his arms crossed looking down his nose, Sakura wasn't looking with her brow furrowed in thought, scrutinizing his plans for flaws or issues he'd overlooked. They just sat, listening. He tried not to let that bother him too much. So that means I want a basic rundown. He pointed to Sakura, knowing she was the weaker of the two and it'd make her feel shitty to go after Sasuke. Go. Ah, uh, well, I, 
she stammered, caught off guard for a moment. But soon enough she cleared her throat and spoke. Well. I had an aptitude for genjutsu in the academy. Both in casting them and spotting them. My taijutsu wasn't so great, though I did master all the academy taijutsu kata. My ninjutsu was average, my accuracy with throwing weapons was average too. She seemed to be getting a little down with the fact that most of her scores beside genjutsu were just average at best. Then he saw her perk up. Oh, my trap-making skills were noted to be very good by Iruka-sensei. Naruto nodded as if this information was anything new to him. Sakura was a textbook blank slate academy student. Ready for any Jounin sensei to mold into something else, something better. He turned to Sasuke. Okay. Your turn. Rookie of the year. He deadpanned. Naruto's smile got a little bit brighter. There it is. Who's the arrogant little fuck? You are. Yes you are. Rather than saying that though he nodded. Yes, and. Sasuke rolled his eyes. I've been taught my clan's taijutsu style and am proficient enough at it. My thrown weapon accuracy was the best of all students, as was my ninjutsu. I know a few ninjutsu outside of the academy basics. While I don't know any genjutsu my ability to spot and dispel them was second only to Hinata and Shino Aburame. My trap-making skills are also excellent. Naruto nodded. Okay then. None of you mentioned chakra control though so we'll start with that. He grinned. You guys know how to climb trees? The looks of incredulity were, thankfully, as expected. Of course we know how to. Without your hands. Sasuke's mouth clicked shut. Naruto nodded, wondering now why it was that Kakashi waited so long to teach it to them. This was pretty much the foundation stone for almost anything else the Genin had to learn. I thought so. He turned and marched over towards the nearest tree planting his foot on it and making his way all the way up till he was hanging upside down by a tree branch. He smiled as he got back down. How'd you do that? Came Sakura's question. He grinned, lifting one foot to tap at the sole. Chakra to the feet. Only one tenketsu there so it's good practice. This is your first exercise. He stepped back, getting back on the tree and beckoning them over. You see, the trick is to have just the right amount of chakra to your feet. Too little and. He demonstrated his left foot sliding this way and that way across the bark. You don't stick. Too much and. The bark under his right foot exploded as he kept himself in place with his left. That happens. Sakura stared, raptured, Sasuke turned, looking for the nearest tree. Before he could leave though, Naruto reached out, tapping him on the shoulder. Hold on now fearless rookie. You'll start soon but we're gonna have to go over a few more things. He stepped off the tree. Okay. So he started searching through his pockets. Where did I, oh, yeah. He pulled out chakra paper, handing a slip to each of them. These are special papers. Push some chakra into them. They did so. As expected, Sakura got earth. Sasuke got lightning first, fire second. What's that mean? Sasuke asked. Naruto opened his mouth to answer when Sakura beat him to the punch. Chakra affinities, she cried, she was all but bouncing on her feet, giddy at the prospect. Oh I read about these. Each ninja has the natural affinity for one, or at most two of the five elements. The five elements are earth, water, fire, wind and lightning. Mine turned to dust so I got earth and you go she stopped, finally realizing she'd gone off on something of a tangent and blushed scarlet. Oh. I'm sorry Naruto s you were going to explain. He shrugged, smiling despite her near slip again. Hey I'm not complaining. Saves me the trouble. But Sakura-chan pretty much nailed it. Every ninja's got at least one chakra affinity for any of the elements. It ain't completely impossible for them to learn other elemental jutsu, but it does take them more time, and more chakra to use M. Especially when it's their natural affinity's weakness. Which are the weaknesses? Sasuke asked. Naruto looked to Sakura. She smiled, all but preening at the chance to show off her book smarts. Fire is beaten by water, water by earth, earth by lightning, lightning by wind and wind by fire. She nodded to herself, as if to confirm the veracity of her memory. Naruto agreed with her. Yup. So my weaknesses would be, water then, since I can counter wind with my fire. Sasuke assessed. And Sakura's would be lightning. What affinities do you have Naruto-san? This time, he did wince. No-san, he said firmly. 
Sasuke talking to him like that was, beyond strange. No san, no sensei, no senpai, no dono, definitely no sama. Just plain old Naruto please. It was hard keeping the desperation out of his voice. Before either of them could comment on it he continued, speaking to get them back on track and away from his behavior. As for my affinities. Wind, earth, and water. Sakura turned and looked at him, eyes wide. Sasuke seemed more curious by her reaction than his admission. That's not possible. She flatly stated. The book said no one on earth could ever have anything more than two affinities. Naruto stuck his tongue out at her. I'm special just to confirm he pulled out a spare chakra paper and pushed chakra into it. Just like it had all those years ago in Suna where Orochimaru nearly flipped his shit, the paper was sliced neatly in two, with one half crumbling to dust and the other becoming brittle and wet. I only saw two. Sasuke replied. The wind element is the cutting in half part. Naruto explained before grinning. Yours didn't cut in half remember? Just crinkled and then lit up on fire. The raven-haired boy shrugged and crossed his arms. He seemed to be taking this a lot better than Sakura who was looking at the remains of paper over his finger as though it should be a shame for going against the word of God written in XYZ book she'd read. Naruto shrugged. She'd get over it. Well that's what I wanted to test. While you guys are mastering the whole tree climbing thing I'm gonna head on over to the library to pick up some of the basic elemental techniques for the both of you. He turned and started marching down the hill, back towards the village. See you soon. And don't slack off. The two Janan watched his abrupt departure with a somewhat detached amusement. Then, Sasuke shrugged and made his way over to the nearest tree, Sakura following his example. XXXXXX. Outside of teaching Konohamaru the sexy no jutsu, Naruto hadn't taught anyone anything. He had no experience teaching, whatsoever. What he did have though, was a lot of experience with a lot of different sensei. Kakashi, Uro Senen, B, Kurama, the six sensei the daimyo had hired to train Kurotsuchi that had ended up training him as well. Itachi this time around for his genjutsu detection and escape, even Orochi team. Hell even Sakura and Sasuke themselves had taught him a thing or two. Long and short of it was, while he wasn't a teacher, he felt he had a fairly good grasp of the way teaching was done. For some people, people like him, better to just do it. Keep beating their head against the wall till they finally got it down and did whatever it was they were being asked to do. For others, reading was good. Naruto didn't enter the library often. Not because they didn't let him in or anything like that. But because he preferred learning by doing, not reading. It was boring. But he knew his Sakura and Sasuke learned a lot of their stuff by reading about it before practicing. They had the mind and patience for it. Hopefully this Sasuke and Sakura would be the same way. Either way when he got to the library, given his inexperience in it, it was no surprise that he needed a little bit of help finding where exactly he was going. Marching up to the counter he wrapped his knuckles over the surface, panning his eyes this way and that way in order to try and find the missing librarian. Over here. Came the voice off to the right, past the bookshelves. He thought libraries were supposed to be quiet places. He turned and walked a little to peer past the stacked bookcase. The librarian was there. So was someone else. Three other someones. Hinata, Kiba, and Shino. He thought the little puppy laying outside on the corner looked familiar. The librarian looked up, adjusting her thick rimmed glasses yes? How may I help you? He opened his mouth and closed it again, eyes drawn to the table where three Genin sat hovering over their respective books. After an awkward second or two he snapped out of it. Ah, yeah yeah. Sorry. I was looking for the starting techniques on elemental manipulation. Fire, lightning and you know what, scratch fire he amended, remembering that Sasuke could already do some fire techniques when they were kids. So just lightning and earth elemental manipulation. Okay. She closed the book she was helping them with, setting it down. You can wait here if you like. I'll bring them over, she said before setting the book down and walking off, leaving him here. With them. He hadn't realized he'd been staring until Kiba looked up, his tone as abrasive as he remembered. The hell you looking at? A dead man. He smiled. Jown and Sensei's got you doing research? Hey. You're Kurenai students right? Yeah, what's it to you? Kiba-san. Shino's voice was laced with admonishment before turning to him. Yes. We are Yuhi Sensei's students Chonin san He nodded. Yeah, she'll uh, she'll teach you a lot. 
He knew that. They were some of the best, before the end. What she got you guys looking up? Alternative ways to dispel Genjutsu. Kurenai Sensei has explained that there are more possible escape methods than what the Academy teaches. Our task is to discover the other means of dispelling illusions. And she will reward us if we were to find them all. Naruto grinned. Ah. Well my name's Naruto. What's yours? I am Aburame Shino. My male teammate beside me is Inuzuka Kiba and our female teammate is Hayuga Hinata. At the sound of her name Hinata looked up, offering him a moment of her attention before she nodded once and turned back to her reading. Just then the librarian returned, three books in her hand. Okay, I got you, the two that you asked for and a synopsis for all five. Naruto smiled, grateful. Thanks. This is gonna help a lot. Okay. Follow me and all you'll sign these out at the front. He nodded, but before he turned around to leave with her he looked to the three genin. Ah by the way, sensory deprivation, sensory overload, rapid environmental changes, opening one of the eight chakra gates, foreign chakra flooding the body, using a body-altering technique, healing an injury on yourself with medical ninjutsu, closing a tenketsu, half of M won't work if the person is crazy good with illusions like Itachi-chan. Take care guys. He left barely managing to hear Kiba's bemused uh, thanks? Behind him as he did. XXXXX. When he returned to the training ground it was to an expected sight. Sakura's tree was perfectly unblemished, with her sitting at the upper branches and Sasuke's tree looking like mulched bark. The second she caught sight of him. Sakura waved. Hello Naruto-san. Oh, sorry. He hoped she'd get used to dropping the san, sensei and everything else from his name real soon. Sasuke turned to look at him, sweaty, panting and clearly irritated. Is there some kind of trick I'm missing? He shrugged. Sakura's just got talent here that you don't. Practice and you'll get there. He brandished the three books. But that can wait. Come here we gotta talk about some more stuff. Sakura carefully placed her feet on the bark, translating from branch to trunk a little awkwardly before walking down the length and breadth of the distance, grinning smugly. Now you're just showing off. Sasuke groused, arms crossed. Sakura smiled, holding her thumb and forefinger a centimeter apart. Maybe just a bit. His Sakura at this age would have been over the moon at the compliment. All but ready to declare her undying love at the barest sign of Sasuke's appreciation. She wouldn't have teased him. His Sasuke wouldn't have said anything at all. This time, the smile slipped from his face, a sad frown taking its place. The two of them turned their eyes from each other and back towards him as Sakura finally closed the distance. Ah, uh, Naruto S. She shook her head, clearly frustrated as she kept slipping. Ah. Uh, are you alright? He cleared his throat. Yeah. Yeah sorry he shook his head. Just remembered something I forgot to do. Anyway let's talk. He looked at the books. This one's for you. He handed Sakura the earth manipulation manual. And this is for you. He handed Sasuke the lightning manual. Naruto. Sakura began. Aren't you an earth user? Why can't you teach me? I could if you really want to. But I had a feeling you'd get your chakra control down before Sasuke. So I figured this would give him a chance to catch up. How'd you figure she'd learn it before I did? She has less chakra. He answered, only half lying. Easier to control. You though, since you have more chakra will probably be able to learn your lightning skill before she learns her earth technique since the ninjutsu's more chakra intensive. He grinned. That means you'll both be done more or less at the same time. Still that's not what we're gonna talk about we need to talk about team dynamics. He plopped himself down right where he stood, the two of them again listening with rapt attention as they sat themselves across from him. Others would consider it insane that he preferred the alternative. Right well, here's the thing. Teams as you know, are normally made of three. Three Genin, three Chonin and so on. The reason for this is because other members of the team can cover each other's weakness. You might have one that specializes in Genjutsu, one that's got long range, one that's good with Taijutsu another with Nin and so on and so forth. I thought the academy based it on test scores. Sasuke put forward. They don't, not really. I mean look at your friends, Ino, Shikamaru, and Kuji. That's just their parents team all over again. You really think they got the exact scores to end up with that specific group twice? Nah. 
Ino Shikacho trio was really effective to everyone's surprise and so the big wigs upstairs want a repeat of that success. Hinata, Kiba, Shino, those three are all excellent trackers, with Hinata's eyes able to see through any genjutsu, Kiba able to handle high speed hit and run attacks while Hinata handles close attrition and Shino handles support. This isn't random chance really. The only scores that are sorta used is the rookie of the year and the dead last thing since that really would be the most fair for the other teams. But other than that the teachers do work to find which combination would be most effective and give the kids their best chance. We do go out there to do some dangerous stuff. They don't want us killed based on random test scores. They just don't want the parents, or the students making a fuss about it so they say it's all based on the scores. Huh. Sakura drew her eyes upwards that, makes a lot more sense. Course it does. He grinned. But anyway back to my point. The three-man balance thing obviously isn't gonna happen with you guys at least not for a while. So you guys are gonna have double the work in order to be able to make up for that missing teammate. That's partially why I'm starting you guys out with elemental manipulation. It's considered pretty high-end, borderline chonin stuff. After that I'm gonna see about getting you guys your own personal taijutsu teachers. You're not gonna teach us taijutsu yourself? Hell no. He answered. That'll just make the whole team predictable at close range. Everyone needs to have their own style. Besides, I already have an idea as to who could help with that particular aspect. After taijutsu training we'll go further into your respective ninjutsu and then we'll go into the most important thing. He paused, grinning as the two leaned forward just a bit. Teamwork. As expected, they looked a little dumbstruck at that. It was Sakura that opened her mouth. Um, Naruto-sensei, shouldn't teamwork come first? You just said that the teams are made too. Yeah I did. And it makes sense and it works but then the problem is that that is what normally works. The bad guys already know to expect teams to know to work together and just work together. They know to break up the team. They know that they need to keep us away from each other otherwise they'll never stop us. Don't you guys remember? He stopped, his mind reeling so hard he actually flinched as he realized he'd nearly allowed himself to slip into a lecture about a war that didn't exist anymore, that never had existed in the first place and never would. How, how the history books, said that, Hanzo targeted Jiraiya, Tsunade and Orochimaru. He'd have patted himself on the back for the save if he wasn't berating himself for needing it in the first place. He separated them and made sure they couldn't combine their skills to bring him down. His pause was noticeable to him, it would have been noticeable to them in a whole different lifetime. But right now, they bought it. Thank God. He continued. So before I teach you guys to rely on each other, you guys need to learn to rely on yourselves. Otherwise the second someone throws a wrench into the team tactics you won't know how to deal with it. That's how it had worked before, that's how they survived. How they charged in day after day after day and came back alive every single time. Because whenever one of them was cut off or injured, whenever an enemy was able to lure them into a trap, isolate them, they were always able to fight their way back to each other, always able to pull each other out of the fire and tear their way out of the encirclement. Because there were no weak links on Team 7 nothing that the enemy could exploit. Together, sometimes it felt like they were unstoppable. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he recognized that Orochimaru himself had the same method of teaching him, Ryoko and Kyofu. He smothered that part of his mind till it shut up and died. He didn't have anything in common with that snake. He shook himself out of it. One thing we're also gonna do to help with that is team exercises with the other teams. It'll be good practice. Like full contact sparring? Sasuke asked. He nodded. Yup. Chances are their sensei are gonna teach them to be fighting as a team right off the bat. So they'll kinda know what they're doing. When I think you're ready I want you both to be able to take their team solo. Sakura's eyes nearly bugged out of her sockets. Take you want us to take them on alone? Three versus one? There's no way. He grinned. Laughing internally as he knew this young girl who looked so scared now would grow up to be one of the strongest Kunoichi Konoha had ever produced. Oh I have no doubt you guys are probably gonna get your asses kicked a lot but there's gonna be a point when you guys are gonna get tired of getting your asses kicked and are gonna win, or at least bloody their nose pretty good in the fight. At that point you'll be ready to start your team exercises and learn to work with each other, then I'd pay to see a Genin team of your friends even try to stop you. He grinned megawatt bright, sure of himself. He intended for them to take their Chunin exam in five months by complete storm. They were gonna steamroll over everything in there if he had any say. It seems like a real long-term versus short-term thing, emphasis on the long part, 
Sakura said, her tone clearly concerned. You worry too much. In all the time we've known each other have I ever let you down. We met each other yesterday. She deadpanned. Exactly he smiled. Not one let down in all that time. She glared and he had to laugh. The look was identical to his memory. He let the humor ease away his smile turning gentle. Don't worry guys, you'll both turn out great. I know it. The two of them didn't seem so sure but that was okay. They were allowed their doubts. He had none. All right. Sasuke ventured slowly. That detailed the training we're gonna be getting, but what about missions? Naruto's smile fell away at that, blinking stupidly as his face went completely blank. What missions? Sasuke looked at him like he was stupid. Missions. He stressed. You know, what a ninja makes his living on, the jobs we're hired to do. He, honestly had to wonder how he'd let that slip his mind. He'd been again and twice, so, so, d rank missions shouldn't have caught him flat-footed, so why? Ah, yeah, that's right. The last time he'd done a d rank mission was well over a decade ago, since in this time period Orochimaru wouldn't have been caught dead leading a team on d rank missions. Yeah, they skipped that part. Dot. How much would it take to convince the old man to allow him the same luxury? He could take Sasuke and Sakura on a couple of C ranks, they'd like it, what are the chances that his luck would be so bad it'd get bumped to an A rank in both lifetimes and risk his friends lives all over again? Dot. Dot. He sighed. Fine, we'll do some D rank missions twice a week. But remember, you asked for this. He groused, pointing at Sasuke's face. Why do you seem so sad Naruto-san? Because D rank sucks Sakura-chan. I'd rather go through my first Chonin exam all over again. You had to take the Chonin exam twice? Nope. Just once, twice. He grinned and once more they had to question their teacher's sanity, or lack thereof. XXXX. Later in the day Naruto returned home after helping his students back to theirs it was to a surprise. More aptly described however, it was an uninvited guest. One with gravity-defying silver hair playing chess on his kitchen table with Itachi. Ah. Naruto-san. Naruto. Kakashi smiled, Itachi nodded. Hey, he said back, closing the door behind him. Um so, what's this? He asked, stepping closer. This my boy is a chess game. The Anbu captain smiled in that familiar way that almost made Naruto want to hug him. Itachi-chan asked me to play. I needed a challenge, she said. I know how to play chess, he said, slightly bemused. I needed a challenge. Yeah walked right into that one. He grumbled, feeling his own stupid before turning to Kakashi. So, what's up? Well I was just curious really. He scratched under his chin, the fabric of the mask making a distinct noise as his nail tugged at the fibers. Imagine my surprise when I get back from my very important mission and hear that someone had informed the Hokage that a very specific someone should take on a very specific team. Naruto let out something of a nervous chuckle. The day he'd heard Sasuke and Sakura graduated and that Kakashi was still the captain of the Anbu he'd done just that, barging into the Hokage's office all but screaming at the top of his lungs that Kakashi was needed for Team 7. Stupid, correction. Very stupid in retrospect. So, Color me curious but I'd like to know why exactly you think I should lead this team. The man drawled eyeing the board. Will you? He perked up, leaning forward excitedly. Kakashi perked right up with him, shoulders bunching up as he smiled, leaning forward like Naruto did replying in the happiest, most high-pitched voice he'd ever used. No. The blonde glared, not amused by the joke. Though Itachi seemed to enjoy it given the tilt of her lips. The copy, wait no more sharing guns, what the hell was he now? Ha, huh, weird, he'd always known Kakashi-sensei as the copy nin, without that it just seemed, may. He mentally shrugged. Oh well. He probably had a different name now and had a whole new bag of tricks up his sleeve. Frankly, he wouldn't be surprised if the I became a crutch rather than an asset by the time he met the man. At any rate, Kakashi chuckled. Like I said I'm just curious. Why did you want me on the team? Naruto shrugged his brain had the time to decide on a cover story since he'd heard Kakashi state his reason for being here, allowing him to seem at least a little more nonchalant about the situation. Well, to be honest everything I'd heard from Enchan here made me think you'd be the best one for the job. Kakashi's single eye gleamed, passing a look at the both of them. 
Really? He nodded. He noticed Itachi nod as well. Kakashi tilted his head. Then he shrugged. May. You're lying, he stated flatly. Naruto was about to deny it when he stopped himself. Kakashi wasn't an idiot. He wasn't Sasuke and Sakura. No point in lying. He also seemed rather non-perturbed by it. The masked man turned his eyes back to the game before he moved his piece and looked to Naruto again. So just tell me one little thing. And this time his face grew serious and Naruto felt the pressure at the back of his mind. Killing intent. It was like blades sliding across his skull. His every instinct told him he was in danger and he had to fight back. He drew that in though, closing his eyes and taking a deep breath. Does your little secret involve anything detrimental to the village? No. Itachi was the one that answered. He said the same a second after she did. Immediately, the killing intent let up, the pressure at the back of his skull, fairly intense even by his standards, vanished immediately. Good. The Anbu chirped, and turned his eyes back to the game. Naruto blinked. Struck stupid weight, what? Seriously? That's it? I have enough stress in my job outside the village. Inside I just want to kick back and relax. You'll tell me eventually if it's important enough. Or it's not important and you won't and I won't have to be bothered. Believe me, why Naruto-kun wants me to train two random genin is far beneath my list of concerns right now. It doesn't even make the top 10. Naruto opened his mouth to speak, then closed it again. I'll tell you what. He began carefully I'll tell you. He noted Itachi's eyes drawing themselves up from the game and towards him. On one condition. Hmm? The Anbu plucked his piece off the board and carefully set its new place, taking one of Itachi's pawns. You, drop by every now and again to help me train them. You do know I'm Anbu captain right? Very very busy. Reading porn. He thought, glaring at the side of the man's head. Not asking for you to be there four or five times a week or whatever but, every now and again you drop by and help. When you feel like it. He suggested. Hmm, okay. Fine. I agree. So what's the big secret? Naruto blinked. I'm not gonna tell you now. Once you know you won't ever show up. Kakashi turned to him, irritation visible, even with his mask. I already said I'd show up Naruto. The blonde blinked. So? Are you calling me a liar Naruto? He hissed, I narrowing. Naruto blinked. Wow. Was he really getting pissed about this? Yeah, kinda. He answered. Kakashi's fist clenched, the muscles of his arm bunching up like he was gonna punch him. Then he turned back to his game, smiling. Good. You'll live longer that way. You taught him well Tachi-chan. I try. Naruto blinked. Then he just shook his head. People honestly thought he was the crazy one. Chapter 31 The Tsuchikage was meeting with the daimyo of Hai no Kuni. The news spread through the village like wildfire, eliciting a reaction that could accurately be described as mixed. While conversations became muted and hushed whispers vanished when she came near, it was more often than not that people didn't notice her, allowing her to eavesdrop with impunity. Most people she'd found didn't know what to feel. It was mostly a numb sense of confusion she gathered. At times even a cautious, wait and see. With others, their sentiments made her feel a bit better, they felt as though it was time for, if not peace then at least time to bury the hatchet. Then there were, of course, the hardcore angry bunch that didn't even want to consider the notion. Or who were guessing this was nothing more than a trap, from either side. It was, more sad than anything else, she found. The sheer loathing that people here felt for anything even remotely related to Hai no Kuni. The hatred ran bone deep. To the point that she'd heard no less than three different groups of people saying that her grandfather, her grandfather, who had run the village since before most people of this village were even alive, wasn't fit to remain in office if he was even considering this in any legitimate way. It made her wonder. Made her worry. She knew how much her grandfather hated Konoha. It was practically a staple of conversation between him and anyone else in the family whenever the subject was brought up. Was he in fact doing this just to lay some kind of trap? Some elaborate ploy? She hoped not, she really really did. For all her talk about leaving her friendship with them at the door of Koto's palace, six years can't be erased no matter how much she tried. And she was trying. And so it was that, after over a month of being in the village that she found her courage to march into the cage tower, moving through the halls with an ease brought on by familiarity more than practice. 
she thought about stopping at the secretary, asking for permission to enter, then promptly dismissed the thought. She never used to ask for permission. She never needed it. Why change things now? Especially when there was a chance she might be turned away. She marched straight past her, and the woman at the desk, looked up from her work in time to see the back of her head as she marched towards the double doors. Miss. Miss. You can't go in there. She turned the knob and opened it, ignoring the protests behind her. Anaki looked up from his desk, irritation clear on the lines of his face before he caught sight of her, and the initial emotion was quickly replaced by surprise. Kurotsuchi? The secretary finally caught up. I'm sorry sir she just moved right past an eye. I it's fine na now. Her grandfather said, holding up his hand before waving her off. Don't worry I'll speak with her. The woman nods, and Kurotsuchi could almost feel the glare at the back of her head as she stepped past the portal and into the room, the door closing behind her. She hoped she didn't look as nervous as she felt. Frankly her grandfather looked nervous enough for the both of them. She'd find it funny if it wasn't so depressing. Um, what, ah, what brings you here? I heard you're going to start some negotiations, she said, straight into the point, this was awkward enough without dragging it out. The old man laced his hands behind his back. A nervous tick? Some kind of sign? It's a shame she didn't know him well enough to know for sure. I will be speaking with Koto. Yes. His face is more neutral now, she notices. Guarded. I'm, is this, are you being serious or is this just? She trailed off. The old man frowned. I will do what's best for my village Kurotsuchi. And what does that mean? She stressed, not appreciating the fact that he was talking to her like, like. An enemy. That means he's stressed. That if what's best for the village is to engage in genuine negotiations with Hino Kuni that is what I'll do, just as readily as I will use this as the opportunity it is if that will serve the village instead. You showed up with 12 Anbu. That's enough potential battle strength to kill him 10 times over. And that was when you were just there for a pickup. Don't think him so weak, or so vulnerable. He answers. The 12 Guardians, a garrison of samurai. I was not going to waltz into that death trap of a palace without making it very clear that he would lose just as much as us if he tried anything. He wasn't going to try anything. The old man scoffed, all but waving off her assessment. You don't know that man like I do he. No, I don't. She interrupted. I haven't seen him on a battlefield, I haven't been on the receiving end of some ambush or surprise attack, or bullshit negotiation. But you haven't lived with him for six years either. So why don't we both just admit we're both ignorant and not get into some debate about his character and just talk about what you're going to do? Anaki stared at her, dumbfounded, his mouth slightly open. A second later she blushed scarlet, from her neck to the tips of her ears. It had been a long time since anyone dared to talk to him like that. She always did have a temper. She saw his frown grow severe, he was very nearly glaring at her with what she'd describe as hostility. She swallowed down the sudden lump in her throat. Look, I'm not saying that you go in there unguarded with arms wide open and your chest exposed. But don't walk in there with a knife in your hand itching to put it in their throat either. Any kind of. Anaki raised his hand, holding it up for silence and she knew well enough to obey. You've made your opinion known. He finally said. And like I said, I will ultimately do what's best for the village. And whatever that may be it will be completely independent to whatever you or I might want Kurotsuchi. I doubt that. She bit down on her tongue, forcing herself to keep those words to herself. Instead, she bowed slightly, prying out the words from her lips. I understand, thank you for your time. Then, without waiting for his leave she turned and marched back, moving quickly to get away from this room before he said anything more. XXX. As she left Anaki opened his mouth, ready to call out to her before he stopped himself, face falling as he heard the click of the door behind her. First his son. Now his granddaughter too. She didn't understand. How could she? When all that she'd been living the last six years was a pretty little fabrication made by the very person he was acting against. Damn that man. He made a gesture, a moment later his Anbu captain shimmered into existence at his side. Sir? How many men have you assigned to the mission? Twelve stealth specialists. He answered. Paired up in six teams of two, they will cover a great deal of ground while the negotiations last, I have also taken the liberty of placing five, fully manned attack teams on standby, ready to come to your aid should it be necessary. Anaki turned his gaze towards him. 
Can we afford all that? Six two-man teams, my six Anbu guards for myself and five full teams, that's nearly 50 shinobi not taking missions for at least the next two weeks. Frankly, I'd rather lose a dime or two than have you ambushed and us unable to respond while your security is under my command sir. We've been getting reports of increased activity from Konoha Shinobi as captain stressed. That Tsuchikage grunted. Right. I can take care of myself you know. With all due respect of course, you're free to take care of yourself on someone else's watch. If you would have forced Kyuchi to accept this mission none of this would be necessary. Anaki scowled. Kyuchi was not high value enough to be attacked, but valuable enough to give the impression the negotiations would be taken seriously. Nothing for it now. He finally said. At any rate he paused, his open mouth closing for a moment. He stayed silent for a while. Perhaps I should have my personal guard. Have? The captain turned his masked face towards him. Sir, as it is with six it would be difficult to keep you safe if Koto decides to sick his twelve guardians on you. If you walk in there with just three, if this is because Kurotsuchi-san. Anaki raised up his hand, asking for silence again. No. It's not because of what she said, not entirely anyway. It's simple, he's going to try something. But if we enter with a full escort, then we have no excuse should one of the stealth teams be discovered. They can claim to be part of my guard, running late or turned around in the forests. They won't buy that for a second. No they won't. He conceded. But they'll have no choice but to buy it. They can't prove any genuine wrongdoing, not without capturing more than one of our teams. And the second they discover one will give the signal to the others to pull back across the border. I don't like this. The man finally answered, though he didn't argue. A potential cover for their spies would be invaluable, even one as paper thin as this. You don't have two, Anaki chuckled, smirking. Hell I don't have two. Just make sure to have those teams ready to attack the second you get word of anything wrong. If things go south, we'll be running as fast as possible to the border and we'll probably need all the help you've got saved up on this side of the line. The captain nodded. We'll be ready sir. XXXX. They're not the same people. It's something that he has to recognize, something that's becoming more and more clear with every passing day. Sasuke is not adverse to asking for help, Sakura does not balk or chafe at the training. He's not so driven, so desperate to become stronger, faster. She's not so dead set on her crush. These things, these, traits, they're still there. He can see them. But not the same. Muted. To Sasuke, strength, for now, is the end goal, not the means to reach a different goal. To Sakura, her crush is a secondary thing. Not the orbit of her every attention. Sasuke is more keen on learning, support techniques quick stealth base strikes than the mid-to-close range specialties he favored previously. Sakura, though clearly having the potential for medical techniques, didn't like them. She was deviating more towards earth-based ninjutsu and genjutsu. She was bored by medical techniques. That might change in time but for now. They're not the same, and he is ashamed, sick to his stomach really, that he wishes he could force the change on them. Force them to be the same people. It's not right, he knows it's not, and every day he tries to push those disgusting thoughts further and further away. He's succeeding, at least he likes to hope he's succeeding at any rate. Most days, it was hard. Then there's days like this. Ow. Shit. Sasuke screamed, yanking his hand out of the thick glove, a finger of which stayed firmly caught on a barb of the barb wire the two Janan had been setting up. His finger had a long cut, and if looks could kill the wooden post and barb wire would be burning cinders right now. Do not say that word, Sakura hissed, tugging and hammering right beside him, the both of them covered in the thick, wet mud of the empty cowpan they were currently fencing. He called it mud to be nice about it. Sasuke turned to him, all but growling. Who in the hell decided these were missions? Naruto grinned where he sat on a nice, dry, clean wooden bench. Don't complain you asked for this remember? Yeah. He nodded, his tone showing just how much he appreciated the joy of D-rank missions like all ninja before him. Yeah I asked for D-rank missions, you know, acting as a courier to an outpost, maybe even filing some papers for the administrative division. Not freaking chores. Better you than me, Naruto said, perfectly frank, grinning smugly. You could help us with some of this stuff. Sakura growled as she tugged on her barbed wire to get it firm as she made it to the next post. It's village law that sensei leave their students to complete D-rank assignments on their own. 
their glares made him choke on his own spit as the laugh bubbled up. If looks could kill. He chortled. Tell you what. If you guys manage to finish this in another 30 minutes I'll take you to the training grounds and teach you something new. How about if you help out I learn any med technique you want? Sakura asked, tugging on a length of wire towards the other post. He grinned. Nice try. XXX. It took them an hour. Not 30 minutes. Still he wasn't gonna cut M loose without doing something with M. Now, if he recalled correctly. Hey, Naruto Sakura winced as she stretched out her arms above her head, tugging one arm up and over the back of her neck until her shoulder gave a satisfying little pop. Yeah? He asked as she let out a breath and allowed her arms to fall back to her sides. I've been wondering. I read some on elemental combinations. Team attacks and such right? Yeah, he said, his mind wandering to where this conversation was going. Well, I've seen combinations with fire and wind, lightning and water, even heard of fire, water and wind to use steam. But, what kind of combos could me and Sasuke use with earth? You're asking me? Why yeah I'm asking you. You have an earth element too don't you? Well, yeah but I never used it with my teammates. Her face. He laughed, and the irritation he saw in her eyes was just beautiful. Sorry. Sorry, he giggled. Look. I know how to use my earth element to be most effective with my fighting style but that's because I already know what I can do to supplement it. I mainly use it, on its own, for defense. If you want to use it with Sasuke for something different, or get more offensive techniques you're just gonna have to get creative. There's nothing more devastating than effective, original techniques. But ninja don't generally start making original techniques until they're jounin. She dismayed. Doesn't mean we can't practice to get a head start. Sasuke put in. Come by tomorrow to the clan compound. There has to be something we can use there. Naruto's smile, to his shame, grew a little sad as he heard the offer. They're not the same people. And he has to remind himself that's not a bad thing. Uh, is that okay? She asked. I mean, that's your clan library Sasuke. He shrugged. I'm pretty sure it's okay. Could you ask? I really don't want to step on anyone's toes. Sure I gue. His statement was cut short as they realized that the training ground they were walking into wasn't exactly unoccupied. Oh. It's Team 10, Sakura cried smiling before she raised a hand and a wave. Hey Hinata-chan. The girl turned, blinking in surprise before she smiled and waved back. The hell are you idiots doing here? Kiba shouted across the distance, crossing his arms as he walked up to Hinata's side, his face scrunched up as he caught sight of Naruto. What the what's up with the Chonin? You stalking Janan teams or something now? Hinata smacked his shoulder, giving him a stern look. Damn, she was even quieter than he remembered. What? The Inuzuka complained, rubbing his abused arm. Apparently she hit a lot harder than Naruto remembered too. He shows up at the library couple weeks ago, now he's following these two around, it's a legit question. He's our sensei, moron. Sasuke drawled. Kiba's laugh was caught in his throat. What? Seriously? The laugh clawed its way up and snaked its way past his teeth. Your short one teammate and now got a shorter sensei? That's just freaking sad brow. The brunette hissed as he pulled his toes out from where they were stuck under Hinata's heel. The pale Hayuga girl rolled her eyes before smiling at the three of them. Then she started doing something that caught him, even more off guard. Sign language. Naruto stared, dumbfounded as the girl communicated with sign language, her mouth moving with phantom words that made no sound. Well at least you're keeping him in line. Sakura smirked. Hinata smiled, and turned, seemingly looking for something. That's when he saw it. Now that he was looking it was obvious, painfully so. A thin scar. The diameter too thin for a normal blade. Wind. Something precise, aimed. Through the side of her neck, behind the windpipe, arteries and delicate tendons. Someone cut her vocal cords. What happened? Listening to me? His sudden reverie was cut short, visibly snapping out of his daze as he turned and found Sasuke staring back at him. What's that? The Uchiha raised an eyebrow. Let's head over to ground 5, it's usually empty I think. He shook his head, he'd come here already knowing Team 10 used it. Nah, let's he paused, taking a moment to clear his throat, and his head, let's train here with them. If Kurenai-chan agrees of course. 
He looked around. Where is she anyway? The veins around Hinata's eyes bulged, the iris becoming visible in the sclera as blood and chakra flooded the orbs. She pointed. Then used sign language again. He was rusty, it had been, forever since he last used it for conversation rather than the quick bursts of orders or information on missions. But still, he wasn't about to make her feel bad by asking someone to translate. As far as he could tell, down that way, 70 or 100 yards, testing the range of Shino's sensory perception with his insects. He was keeping an eye on them. Now on their way back. He'd probably seen their arrival and told Kurenai. God, why was Hinata so badly hurt? Sasuke raised an eyebrow. You want us to train with them? Oi. What the hell is that supposed to mean? He forced the thought out of his mind, forced himself to compartmentalize it, to deal with it later, to act normal. Yeah. He answered, ignoring Kiba. It'll be good for you guys. How exactly? Sasuke questioned. We fought and trained in the academy remember? I could beat them there. Hey screw you asshole. You'll see. He smiled, ignoring Kiba again. At that point Shino and Kurenai came through the trees, with both sensei and student arriving with feet landing softly on the grass. Hi Shino-kun, Sakura shouted, waving at him like she had at Hinata. Haruno-san, Uchiha-san. He greeted in turn. Hello. My name is Yuhi Kurenai. The brunette greeted, cordially, if not entirely warm. Is there anything we can do for you? Heya. The blonde grinned, stepping forward and extending his hand for her to shake. I'm the awesome Chonin sensei for Sasuke and Sakura here. Kinda hoping we could work together on some joint exercises. Kurenai raised a slender eyebrow as she shook his hand. A Chonin sensei for Tujinan? That's, odd. Naruto shrugged. Hokage liked me enough for the job. I suppose that's good enough for me, she said, still looking unsure. But why exactly would you want joint training exercises? He gestured her over, stepping away, out of earshot, even Kiba's ears, and placing his back towards them so Hinata couldn't lip read. Well, Kurenai chan it's like this. Way I efgure it, we both want one T well two things. One that our students are ready for anything, and two that they pass the Chonin exams, yeah? Go on. She answered neutrally. Well, you and I both know that both on missions and their Chonin exams they'll have to fight other ninja yeah? Well Hayuga and Inuzuka are some of the best close-range combatants, some would say the Hayuga are the very best. Exercise with them would force Sasuke and Sakura to adapt other means of engaging close-range specialists and Shino, well, his advantage is obvious. He can eat chakra. It would force Sasuke and Sakura to think of ways to either end the engagement quickly, or to use tools and skills that don't rely on chakra when they have to conserve it. So far you've explained how this arrangement benefits your team. Not mine. She pointed out. I'm gonna be helping Sasuke and Sakura develop their skills in a lot of fields. Eventually, they're gonna learn counters to those wonderful clan techniques. Then your team will have to think of supplements and ways of making those clan techniques stronger and covering their own weaknesses. Win-win for everyone right? Except that it's just as likely your team will hold back those trump cards for when they really need them and throw mine completely out of the running in the Chonin exam, should they attend together. He winced. Okay, Ma Abi, that was true. What if I promise that they won't do that? He smiled. Her answer was a raised eyebrow. I'd say nice try but to be honest, that was pretty weak. Yeah I figured. He pouted. Well, what if I agreed to give Hinata, Kiba and Shino one good B-rank technique? What makes you think I can't teach my own students? Well, because you're a Genjutsu specialist who was a low-tier A-rank at best, and never really specialized over much in Nin or Tai Jutsu which your team specializes in. It's not that you can't teach M, it's just that I. He trailed off. Her frown grew more severe. Suddenly, T hit him. Come on. He moped, lowering his eyes a bit. This is my first time teaching. I really need another set of eyes if I'm not gonna screw up. So you want help? Yeah, pretty much. Why come to me? My other option is Guy. Yeah. He grimly nodded. I suppose we could group together for sparring matches and progress checks once a week or so. She grudgingly admitted. He beamed a megawatt bright smile. Thanks a lot. This'll be great. She nodded, uncrossing her arms and moving to walk past him when he stopped her. Hey, 
Kern I Chan? Yes? Uh, he not a, she's. Mute yes. Why? What happened? An attack, years ago, she said. I'm surprised you didn't hear. I've been gone for quite a while, how many years? Ah yes. I remember hearing about that now. You were with the daimyo yes? He nodded. Five or six. She answered. Kumo Nin I believe. Five or six, just after he left or a year after he left. Damn it, he hissed. If he wanted to protect his friends, so far he was doing a horrible job of it. He smiled, though it didn't quite reach his eyes. All right well. No better time to start this training thing right? Luckily, Kur and I wasn't looking at him and by the time he reached his, friends, he buried it. It was getting easier to do that. XXX. By the time he got home, it was to another surprise. Again. He closed the door with a snap. Honestly. Why do I put a lock on my door, or have you house sitting? Itachi shrugged, flipping a page on her chosen book. You never said to keep people out. He face palmed, even as he caught the slight smirk tugging at her lips. Oi. What's that supposed to mean? You avoiding us Naru-chan? Ryoko shouted from his living room couch, or better to say from his living room floor, her feet propped up on the couch. We wanted to come see you. Kyofu frowned from where she sat across from Itachi. We weren't sure why you were avoiding us. I wasn't avoiding you. He protested, surprised. We've been back here a month and haven't seen you since you inconsiderate ass. Ryoko rolled back to spring up onto her feet. You know at first I thought you were playing hot Uchiha mama with Miss Tall Pale and Sexy over here. It was amazing how Itachi didn't even bat an eye from her book while he was choking on his own tongue. But then we go and find out you have students now. The silver-haired Chonin scoffed. Come on Naruto. You could at least go through the whole song and dance of the breakup lines it's not you, it's me and I need some space before trying to split up the team. She joked, but the smirk on her face was a little uncertain. Boy. I'm just nailing bullseyes today huh? It's not like that guys really. I just. I asked Naruto to take over Sasuke's training. Itachi suddenly said, reminding him of their impromptu cover story. Frankly, Chonin or not, he is one of the best shinobi I know. He breathed a mental sigh of relief, thanking his roommate for the quick save. Look guys. The very last thing I want is to break up the team or hurt you guys, you're my friends. Hell, if I do my job right they'll be Chonin themselves in 6 months, no wait, 5 months, Chonin exams in 5 months. He nodded to himself at the correction. Kyofu sighed. I guess. Just kinda bummed. You get back after six years and you're off doing your own thing before we can even blink. Ah. Ryoko walked forward, wrapping her arms around his neck. They grow up so fast don't they Kyofu-chan? He's already spreading his little wings. He smiled, not struggling against her hold. I'll make it up for you guys. You can eat here tonight okay? Sounds good to me. Ryoko pushed him forward, towards the kitchen. Get to it boy toy and make it good. Sure. He called behind him. I already chopped up the rat poison for your plate. He ducked into the kitchen as a fork passed his head and smacked into the refrigerator before clattering to the floor as he laughed. So how many students do you have anyway? He heard from Kyofu. Two. He answered as he started pulling out his ingredients. You need any help with them? He paused. XXXX. She stood on the village walls. The people bustled and milled around in the streets below as she walked across the barely manned fortifications. You still like this spot huh? She turned, looking to the source of the voice only to find Akatsuchi negotiating his way up the very narrow set of steps, his bulbid red nose made all the more red in the high noon sun. She leaned back on the walls buttresses yeah. She answered with a smile. It's, familiar. He smiled, and marched over to join her, leaning at her side, the two of them looking over the village. In the distance she could see it, the Chonin and Janan beginning to open the primary avenue to exit the village. Anaki would be making his way down this thoroughfare soon. Not in so much a parade but enough to make it plenty official. Penny for your thoughts, he said. You won't like my thoughts. She flatly replied. You're worried, and pissed. She shook her head. It's just. She took a breath. It's just goddamn sad you know? 
you have a chance even a small chance to open up a genuine negotiation but everyone is too busy being suspicious and looking for an opening to take it. Konoha Ninja killed your mom. He reminded. Yeah, you're right, they did. But I never knew her, I know Koto so that definitely makes me biased and when they say I'm not thinking clearly, who knows, they're probably right but, she sighed, aggravated. Uck, I don't know, this whole situation just fucking sucks. He placed a hand on her shoulder. Hey, he said suddenly, they're leaving. She opened her eyes, looking down from the village walls. That's, a freaking small escort. She blinked, pushing off the wall to get a closer look. Three. Just three on boo. She smiled, alright guys, that's it for the video. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. As always, the rest of the story is already out over on Patreon, link to that will be in the description. Anyways, until next time, peace.